Thank you. If you'd please stand and join me in council prayer. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this council, direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of the city of Clarence. Amen. Amen. And before proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge the, and pay respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and their leaders, past and present, on whose ground that we are meeting tonight. Thank you. Uh, tonight's meeting is a special council meeting. Um, my name's uh, Doug Chipman, Mayor of the City of Clarence, and I've got the pleasure of welcoming you. The meeting is being uh, transmitted live by YouTube, and um, there will also be a copy of the agenda on the <coughs> website. There are a number of amendments to uh, the officer's recommendation for tonight's uh, dealing with the local provision schedule for the Clarence draft planning scheme. And we will work through those um, amendments one by one. And with that, we'll get underway, noting that Alderman Kennedy is an apology. Could I ask for declarations of interest of Alderman or Post Associate, please? There being none, I move to item three, deputations by members of the public. Um, we have 10 altogether. Um, the general manager will provide a uh, brief snapshot of each. All aldermen have received a copy of those uh, full representations and deputations, and uh, they'll be taken as read, but I will ask the general manager to give us a summary of each one. General manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as uh, you indicated, there were 10 deputations and in the circumstance of tonight to give uh, voice to each of those, we'll provide a summary. Uh, so I'll work through that summary list now. Um, the first deputation was from Mr Malcolm Purcell, uh, representing the oak, group, oak tree group in Tasmania and the owners of 476 and 478 South Arm Lauderdale. Uh, the issue raised uh, is in regard to rezoning uh, of uh, the rural living zone in Lauderdale. Uh, Oak Tree and the current landowners fully support council with the inclusion of the rural lot that is part of 476, 478 South Arm Road to be included in the recommendation to the Minister for changes to the urban growth boundary. Deputation number two is from Chris and Sue Johnston. Uh, they, they raise uh, the issue of the Lindisfarne Ridge Rural Living Zone rezoning and they offer their support for rezoning to low density residential. Deputation number three is from Francis Beasley and uh, that deputation is on behalf of clients of ERA Planning and Environment uh, and in respect to representation number 81. Uh, the issue that is raised in, is in respect to 450 Rokeby Road rezoning uh, and they indicate that they do not support the proposed rural zoning of their client's land at 450 Rokeby Road, Howrah and proposes that the land be zoned general residential. Deputation number four is from Quentin Villanova of Capital Investments representing the Jurious Family Trust the Lambrakis Family Trust and In The Pipeline Proprietary Limited. The issue they raise relates to rezoning of Central Lauderdale and they offer their support for rezoning of Central Lauderdale to future urban similar to the original status it had under the original Clarence City Council planning scheme where it was zoned reserved urban. Deputation number five is from Mr Jonathan Blood at uh, Loki Architecture and Planning. Uh, the issue raised is in relation to zoning for 469 Rokeby Road uh, and they request, uh, they are looking for support to modify the draft LPS to consolidate zoning at 469 Rokeby Road to reflect the long-standing existing use of that site. Deputation number six is from Mr John Cleary. Uh, and that deputation is in relation to the Lindisfarne Ridge Rural Living Zone slash Flagstaff Gully rezoning. And uh, they are supporting uh, rezoning to low density residential in that area. 
Deputation number seven is from Sam and Rachel Samet, uh, and again in relation to Lindisfarne Ridge uh, Rural Living Zone slash Flagstaff Gully rezoning, and they offer their support for rezoning to low density residential. Deputation number eight is from Alex Brownlee of GH&D, representing the Jurius Flat Family Trust, Lambarca, Lambracus Family Trust, and In the Pipeline Pro Proprietary Limited, regarding the rezoning of Central Lauderdale. Again, uh, seeking support for the rezoning of Central Lauderdale to Future Urban. Deputation number nine is from Alison Dunn and Jerry Gregor. Uh, in respect to Lindisfarne Ridge Rural Living Zone slash Flagstaff Gully rezoning, uh, and <coughs> specifically representation number 83, uh, supporting uh, rezoning to low density residential in that area. Deputation number 10 is from Suzanne Hovington, uh, raising a number of issues uh, related to rezoning of the land at 424 South Arm Road, Lauderdale, and 25 Acton Road, Acton Park from rural living to community purpose, and then raising a range of issues not directly related to the LPS considerations in respect to 4 and 6 Ringwood Road, 26 Manata Street, 514 and 526 South Arm Road, and 16 and 36 North Terrace, Lauderdale. And that is, concludes the summary, Mayor. Uh, thank you, General Manager. We now move on to uh, item four, um, the draft current cycle provision schedule. And uh, for that, we, I need to advise that we are sitting as a planning authority under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act. If I could... Um, yeah, I just have a question in relation to one of the deputations. Certainly. Look, I'm uh, in the interest of uh, progressing this as quickly as possible, yeah. I'm happy to take... It was it. just that um, the original representation to us on 450 quarry, on 450 uh, Rugby Road for the quarry related to a recommendation to move it to general, general residential plus open space. Yes. Yes. And the representation we've heard tonight doesn't make any reference to open space at all. So I'm wondering whether um, Richard whether Alderman James is um, aware of that change, and if so, does he intend to change his alternate recommendation? Well, I guess that will be revealed as, uh, as we move. Um, Just a question, though, to clarify that they sure, were not and, asking and for a double open space on their deputation. So if the, because they were summarised, they weren't read out. So I just want to make sure that... I think it relates to... Um, thank you, Alderman Mulder. I think it relates to deputation number three, uh, and that was the deputation from Francis Beasley uh, of era planning and just uh, scanning through that. Ah, uh, yes, in the in the first. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, we've admitted the reference to open space, so that should be included. Thank you, so, thank you for the thank you for raising that. That was what was important to ask it now. It was. Thank you. Um, the way uh, we'll proceed with this is if we can have the officer's recommendation on the table with a move and a seconder. The mover and seconder would have the chance to speak to that and then the floor will be open for um, amendments and proposed amendments in a normal way and will obviously require each amendment to be moved and seconded and uh, debated and then voted on. And with amendments there's no right of reply at the conclusion of the debate. So if I could have a mover for the officer's recommendation please. Uh, it should be someone who doesn't propose a m amendment. <laughs> yes, it will. Yes. Uh, Alderman, uh, Alderman Walker, thank you. Yeah. Uh, has moved it or seconded it? You've no, moved? It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, we'll take Alderman Chong as the seconder, Alderman Walker as the mover. Alderman Walker. <coughs> uh, before us, we have the comprehensive document tonight that is the structure and the nature of this meeting. Uh, I'm moving this motion. I highly recommend it in its current form and uh, seek amendments accordingly. Thank you. Do uh, you wish to speak, Second? Oh, I'd like to do my right to speak, Second. Thank you. Um, I think the first item there is uh, the first proposed amendment is Alderman James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, uh, my amendment is, is in accordance with the uh, uh, amendment number one 
to rezone the rural living area B, two hectares on the zone land in the Cambridge Acton Corridor to area, air, uh, <laughs> excuse me, area A, one <laughs> hectare. Do we have a seconder, please? Uh, Alderman Mulder, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Mulder. This uh, matter has been on the Council's agenda for a number of years, and over the years we have seen development uh, on the Acton Corridor and seen different lot sizes. And prior to the clearance in from planning scheme of 2015, there was a proposal, and there was a number of proposals put up, and they basically uh, were for the uh, uh, smaller lot size from two hectare to one hectare, and they were approved before the 2015 came into effect. The nature of this is that because there's been a number of representations, and also accordance with the objective set out in Schedule 1, and that is because the change would free up additional lots quickly without the need to provide additional infrastructure to address the current housing shortage. And also it, it provides that listening and heeding the representations encourages public involvement in land use and management. The fact of the matter is, Mr Mayor, there is in fact a line that is drawn down the Acton Corridor and also in the Cambridge area whereby on the basically top side of the road you have the two hectare lots and then on the other side of the road in close proximity to that you have a subdivision with smaller lots and you also have those number of lots that were successful in being able to be um, downsized from two hectares to one hectare prior to the introduction of the Clarence Interim Planning Scheme of 2015. The proposal um, under the local provisions schedule LPS zone is that because two hectare lot sizes do not recognise the existing set uh, settlement pattern and earlier schemes that were, had been introduced where the density rating was one lot per hectare for the entire Acton Corridor and the local provision schedule zone and the code application because it was under that particular zone. The landscape values can be protected through the application of relevant codes and the land is not suitable for agricultural use. I seek council support. Thank you, Lord and Mark. Thank you, Mr. Um, yeah, I don't intend to go through the reasons or repeat them once at all. Um, and perhaps an overarching statement that I won't hope to go and repeat. Um, what we are looking for, we are not rezoning or, rec or uh, making a decision to rezone anything here. What we are doing is we are making, we are making recommendations to the Tasmanian Planning Commission, whose province it has always been to actually make the rezoning decision. All we do is uh, put our advice and our recommendations to them. Now the purpose of this one, of this uh, particular uh, LPS thing, is an opportunity to um, comment upon community perspectives of the advertised draft LPS. So that provided, um, so we are free to make any recommendations we like, provided that they meet the objectives of the uh, Land Use Planning and Approvals Act, and those, um, and those objectives are particularly pointed are uh, that there will be community involvement, which is what's happened when they've been advertised and gone out to representations, and that there will be um, cooperative, there will be involvement of all the three levels, engagement of all the three levels of government, including uh, local government, um, and that's what we are here for. So, um, provided we are reflecting what the community wants. The last thing when it comes to zonings is that um, they must meet, the proposed zoning that we are talking about must meet the guidelines that have been issued in relation to LUPA. And um, in each uh, case, I think, um, if you look at the reasons, those um, guidelines are addressed. And, um, and in this one in particular, I'm satisfied that um, the guidelines and the objectives of LUPA are being accurately pursued. And that if, uh, if the community want that, then uh, I'm happy to recommend to the PPC should also be recognised that the Planning Commission will, um, if it is minded to uh, take note of these representations, um, it, may, it will then be required to re-advertise many of these things because the broader community has not been consulted on this proposal compared to the one that was originally advertised. So 
Um, having put that all aside, I'm satisfied that this um, that the, uh, the uh, alternative motion meets the requirements of LUPA and the guidelines for rezoning, and I will therefore endorse it. Thank you. Other speakers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, tonight Council is sitting as a planning authority to focus on a key strategic land use planning matter. And that is the lens through which we should view each of these alternative recommendations by an alderman to the officer's recommendations. The planning officers have a detailed understanding of the relevant statutory and strategic considerations, including the Land Use Planning Approvals Act, state policies, the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy and Guideline Number 1, which has been provided by the Tasmanian Planning Commission to help apply zones and codes in the drafting of the LPS. They also have experience with the TPC's approach to developing a planning scheme, and that's been gained through being conversant and involved with previous decisions, panel hearings and practice notes. On an ongoing basis, they've been provided with directions from and discussions with the TPC officers leading up to the exhibition of the LPS. In reviewing the representations received from the LPS exhibition, officers have developed criteria to assess the merits or otherwise of each representation. And these criteria have provided consistency. From my perspective, these criteria are sensible, relevant and fair. And I believe as a planning authority, we should be abiding by these criteria as we consider the Alderman's alternative recommendations. In relation to this particular Alderman's recommendation, the officers have gone through the representations and have determined that the Southern Tasman Regional Land Use Strategy is met, the guideline, the relevant aspect of the guideline is not, there's not a like for like conversion of the current planning scheme. There's an issue in relation to natural justice and therefore the merits of the representation do not warrant a change. And I think it's really important for us to note the definition of natural justice as the officers have applied it. And I believe that we need to use the definition that the officers have used right throughout this particular document in terms of looking at the representations. So we need to maintain consistency. Natural justice is taken to mean procedural fairness and due process sufficient to ensure third party interests are not compromised. In this context, they may be the owners of subject property, adjoining owners, nearby owners or the community more generally. Yes means that it's very likely that a particular outcome will be of public interest and may result in negative impacts to some people. No means that it is unlikely that a particular outcome would impact third parties. The issue of natural justice is relevant to this assessment as the TPC has historically not supported requests that had the potential to compromise the public interest without being subject to an, an exhibited process. So I think that's incredibly important that we keep that natural justice perspective in mind. The officers have said that there is no supply and demand analysis across the region and that that is important because it needs to lead to a Rural Living Act and Corridor strategy. They also note that the previous Resource Planning and Development Commission decision rejected one hectare loss. They focus on the natural justice aspect, which I've just spoken about, and there's a history that shows opposition to smaller lot size and further subdivision. And they make it clear 
that this particular or these particular representations don't meet the guideline number one and they do not meet the like for like requirement. <coughs> Importantly, they've also looked at the impact. Thank you, Alderman Von Berta. Are there any other speakers? Alderman Eureka and then Alderman Von Lee. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, um, I've always thought prior to getting involved in council in relation to and seeing all the, the legal and the, and the um, bureaucratic uh, stuff that we have to deal with when we get into the chamber and, and deal with it in, in meetings and that sort of thing, that um, you know people should have the right to, to make their own decisions to up to a certain point as long as they don't affect other people. And it's quite obvious to me from the representations that have come through um, in the people that are affected or have taken the time to, to uh, make a presentation to us that they strongly support the change to through Acton Corridor to actually change it back from two hectare to one hectare. I mean, the reality is, as uh, Alderman Jones pointed out at the beginning, there's a line in the sand where a lot of people have got two hectare blocks and on the other side of the road, people have got one hectare blocks. And I think that, um, you know, th there's really no rational reason why that should be the case in my mind. Uh, if we talk about the natural justice side of things, I mean, the reality is we're never going to keep everyone happy and to suggest that we don't change things just because we, just because we might upset someone. Um, I certainly don't think, you know, we'd ever get anything done if we, if we relied on that one. I mean, I know planners mean well and they, uh, they are trained a particular way to go about their work in a particular way, um, and they're just doing their job, but I think that um, sometimes we tend to over-regulate some of these things, and I think giving people the opportunity, especially at the moment, um, to have access to the uh, unearned or unrealised uh, um, economic value of their land, certainly going through the, the COVID situation at the moment is something that we need to take into consideration when we're making decisions about this one, but also everything else that we talk about tonight. Um, you know, if we're ever going to get to the point where, um, you know, some people, it's got the only thing they've got left to probably get them to retirement or, or get them to the point where they can even survive, and I think we've got to remember that one as well. Um, you know, and then we also talk about the other issue that's pretty, um, you know, important and, and gets a lot of airplay at the moment is the homelessness and the housing affordability issue. And for us to lock up uh, blocks even longer for any reason, um, you know, if we reduce the supply, even though there might not have been a, uh, a specific study on the uh, uh, supply of blocks or those sort of things out there, I mean, obviously, if we reduce the, the level of supply, that's going to have an impact on cost. And I think we all know that having, uh, you know, less of a particular product or service available means that the prices are likely to be higher. And I certainly think that having more, more availability out there is going to help people a lot more. And the thing is, too, the economic activity that we have a responsibility to be, uh, you know, aware of and, and, to, and to be able to support. Uh, because if governments, you know, whether it be local government, state government, and federal government, if they don't have access to the economic activity through uh, the rates and taxes that they receive, well, then we're certainly not in a position to help anyone out in other ways um, who might need our help through, you know, homelessness or any other uh, situation. So I strongly encourage, um, and, and on that one there, I'd, I'd encourage any of my other fellow aldermen who have an issue with the homelessness and the housing affordability issue to come up with another strategy that's going to deal with that. Because I really, to be honest, can't think of any other way that we can do that other than increasing supply and the opportunity for people to use their land and, and take advantage of the unrealised um, economic value of that and, and, and increase the supply as well. So, look, I, I strongly support this change and I think that, um, you know, there's still a lot of hoops for everyone to go through in terms of uh, having their chance to have some input into the decision. Uh, there's opportunities for us to sort of come back to council and have to consider, um, you know, each case on its merits as well. So I think that um, you know, they've still got to comply with rules and policy. So I strongly support my fellow aldermen to to support this initiative um, at the moment, and I would uh, hope that we see fit to actually, um, you know, pass it. In, you know, because of all those reasons. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, like all colleagues. Uh, uh, I'm very well aware of why we're here tonight and what we're, what we're sitting as and uh, what particular lens we have to view the material uh, before us through. But I'm also very clear, Mr Mayor, the role of officers is to advise, the role of elected members is to decide. And that's what we're doing tonight, Mr Mayor. And Mr Mayor, um, I wholeheartedly support this amendment. It is an issue, Mr Mayor, you may recall, that was before us 20 years ago, when we were first elected to this place. And I've got to say, I'm absolutely stating that in the past two decades, there has not been a supply and demand analysis that is often quoted as a reason why people cannot go ahead 
and subdivide the two, acre, two hectare lots in half. This seashore line, Mr Mayor, is right up there with Rosny Hill and Kangaroo Bay as to the level of community uh, interest in being able to unlock their land, enable, in being enabled, Mr Mayor, to, to, to uh, enact a sensible and appropriate change. We advise, Mr Mayor, that uh, one hectare minimum lot sizes would increase density and maximise the use of existing services and infrastructure. That's pretty clear. What it will also do, Mr Mayor, is potentially double our ratepayers at very little cost to the ratepayers of this city. The change will be minor, as a rural living zone would remain, and the change will be limited to the conversion from rural living B to rural living A. Mr Mayor, this is a sensible and appropriate change, and I urge colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you. Other speakers? There have been no right of reply on this, uh, so the motion is, as depicted on the board, to amend the officer's recommendation. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving to mooted amendment number two, Gordon Mulder. I will moot the amendment standing in my name. Do I have a seconder, please? Uh, Alderman Newington, thank you. Alderman Mr. Mulder. Many of the same arguments apply as to the last time, um, so I won't, I won't go over them uh, again. But to be, to be quite brief is um, the references to supply and demand analysis. I often wonder why bureaucrats and policymakers would sit back here and say, we want you to do a supply and demand analysis before you risk your money. These people who are doing these developments are risking their own money. <coughs> and if you need, and if you, you know, if you need to have some analysis of demand, can I suggest you just read the newspapers and listen to the uh, to the current housing crisis? The secret with an oversupply of land is that the supply and demand are normally uh, will be orchestrated through the price mechanism. And if we are talking about affordable land then we at every opportunity must try to create an oversupply of land because it is the cost of land that is the huge variable, not the cost of construction. And we've seen that with, um, with widespread reports, for example, of uh, when you stick a homeowner's grant in, right, the first thing that happens is the price of land goes up, not the price of building because that remains the same. However, the builders, like this council, are the meat in the sandwich quite often of these decisions and they get accused of upping the price of the dwelling when in fact it's the price of the land that's been artificially up. That's what happens when governments start interfering in the market and the price of, and the, uh, price of the land settlement. The other issue that's been made sometimes is that um, we're supposed to uh, sort of second guess the Commission with references to is this likely to succeed in the Commission? That's not our job. Our job is to advise the Commission, which what, what we as a council, representing the people in our area and representing the people that have represented to us, right, to make of that the best that we can, given the, given the circumstances. And then we look at the other issues which relate to this sort of land, which is the settlement patterns. This land at, uh, in, in this corridor is also a question of various kinds of settlement in these areas. Some of the blocks are sub-minimal. The moment you hear the word sub-minimal, there is a variation to the settlement pattern, as in the last one. And, um, and, and the thing about it is that, yeah, so, and if you go and have a look at guidelines, um, and I'm not going to read them all out, because we've all no doubt had a good look at them. If you have a look at um, the uh, Rural Living Zone 11, on page six of the guideline document that everyone is supposed to be using, you will find that the majority of this land easily fits with all the criteria for rural B, uh, rural Asia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just the other one there, I mean, the thing that we need to remember too is that if people decide that they don't want to go to one hectare on these properties, they have the choice to stay as they are. And, and I think, you know, in any situation like this, we. we you know, we, we have to give people choice over their own property, and I think that's what we're giving people here, and I think that's a critical thing that we need to remember. Um, 
The other side to, to, to add to all of my models comments here about our role in relation to um, how we influence the planning commission. And I think it's really important that that we, by, by get, making these changes, we are making them actually look at these things. You know, if we just sat back and said it's all too hard, no, we need to do another structure plan, we need to plan, we need, we need more bureaucracy to sort of control our lives. Well, you know, the people sitting back, and some of these people have been waiting, at, as uh, um, Alderman uh, Blomley said, you know, 20 years for these things to happen. I think we've waited long enough, and I, and I strongly support my colleagues, um, you know, to support this motion, you know, pretty much in the same way as the, as the first one that was up or the first amended. Um, motion. So, look, you know, it gives people choice. It creates all the things that we think that we're here to help the community achieve. Um, people want to live in these places, and we should be allowing them to uh, to have that choice. And I encourage everyone to vote for this one as well. Other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I won't be supporting this alternative recommendation. Um, as with the previous alternative recommendation, which was successful. Uh, the officers have made it very clear that once again there's no supply and demand analysis across the region which is important and necessary in terms of the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy. Once again uh, the RPDC decision in relation to this area of Sanford is very much the same not supported in the past. There is a natural justice issue here in relation to various people within this community um, would actually not want to have their land uh, rezoned because rezoning has a number of implications and one of those is that rates increase. So that's something that uh, needs to be taken into account. Also, in addition to the issues related to the Acton and Cambridge corridor, in Sanford there's actually a lack of reticulated services and there's a reliance on carted water. There's a concern of an increased load on the South Arm Road and the Mornington Roundabout and there's likely to be an impact on the natural assets and much of that is actually covered with the Natural Assets Code. I do think it's important to note the officer's experience in relation to dealing with the Tasmanian Planning Commission. And for this one, they actually say that the impact on the whole of the LPS is high. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And they also say that the likelihood of success of the alternative recommendation <coughs> is low. So it's even more so than the previous alternative recommendation which was successfully voted on, where that was actually a moderate impact on the LPS as a whole with a likelihood of low success. So this is even more of a concern if we actually recommend this to the Tasmanian Planning Commission. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll be very brief here. As I think was pointed out in the, uh, in the earlier uh, conversation today, um, the, the chance of success, whether we do it rightly or not, we can't preempt a decision of the Tasmanian Planning Commission. That's not our job. Our job, sitting as a planning authority for the City of Clarence, is to make decisions based on professional advice that we then determine is in the best interests of the residents and ratepayers and the future of this great city. Mr Mayor, an increase in rates only comes, in through, only comes about through an increase in land value. What this will allow is opening up further supply as all the Newington's touched on earlier this evening. And surely that's got to be a driver for this council. Allowing other people who are crying out to move to the eastern shore, who at the moment are unable to afford uh, the pleasure that we all enjoy. This will open up and increase that supply, Mr Mayor. It will, as all the Newington correctly pointed out earlier, uh, address uh, 
uh, in some way the homelessness issue. The issue that we all hand on heart several months ago said, oh yes, we're, we're fully committed to making sure people aren't homeless. We'll do our bit. Well, here's our opportunity this morning. Here's our opportunity to send a very clear message that we listen to the people of Clarence, we are fair-minded, and we will support appropriate development in our city. Thank you. Other speakers? <coughs> Look, it is pertinent to this, but possibly even more pertinent to the motion that was just immediately proceeding. If you want to supply and demand analysis, you can't go past the uh, Mercury supplement this morning called the Hobart Living. Supply and demand driving prices and how it affects is laid out clear pertinent and it's very clear with what it was for Act. And so um, those sort of studies can be nebulous and good, but ultimately the market is probably the strongest determinant. Um, and I would just be saying that issues such as uh, the previous one and this one, uh, in, a, in a COVID environment where people, a uh, post-COVID environment where people are wishing to work from home, but it's this sort of lifestyle utopia that, uh, that has been craved. So um, I will be supporting this. I might take the opportunity to make some sort of broad comments, but they relate to this as well. Um, first, I'd just like to acknowledge the amount of time and effort that's gone from both um, elected um, people and uh, our officers, particularly off support and all the Mulder, to pulling all this together. Um, I was joking with the general manager before we started that this whole thing feels like a bit of a game of football where the TPC, you just pick the ball up whenever they feel like it anyway, or take it out of the goals and put it in the other goal. So while some of this has been a bit um, uh, dispiriting along the way, I suppose, um, I've enjoyed the debate. I think there's been a lot of great points made on both sides of the original debate and this one. Um, you know, so we're here, and I guess my approach tonight is going to be supporting up as much land as possible being opened up where practical um, and where suitable. Now, there obviously are inconsistencies around the city. You don't have to look at Rosalind Park to see how inconsistent Clarence City is. Um, I don't necessarily think there are reasons to create more inertia and, and, and retain those um, inconsistencies. Um, so yeah, that would be my approach, supporting up opening land uh, as quickly as possible, as much as practical. Um, when we followed up a couple of meetings ago when we were debating the urban growth boundary, um, talking that I, I, I feel like the, the housing crisis and the approach to that is um, really difficult to solve when uh, elected and unelected decision makers, particularly in state parliament, you know, they're, they're people who have passed the 70, 80% mark of their mortgage or have paid it off or are on their second fight of the uh, housing market. They're not people who, are, as uh, Alderman Blomer referred to, are chomping at a bit to get in or can't afford to get in because they're just being priced out. So I think there's been a few references to housing crisis tonight and homelessness, which may be less related. But um, so I think that's that's really driving uh, my approach. Um, the TBC is obviously the next step, and I think uh, a few aldermen have touched on the fact that uh, uh, we're uh, are looking to chain, I suppose. And uh, the only thing we can really do is knock things on the head. Things can still go to them and then be knocked on the head once they get there. Um, I agree with the points on the supply and demand analysis as well, that um, uh, you don't have to talk to anyone under the age of 40 in this uh, greater city or in fact the whole state to understand that that is 100% the case. And uh, people are either drowning on their way up or they just completely aren't able to bust in and uh, are paying uh, rent through their necks to, to no relief at all. So um, that sort of sums up my comments broadly on the topic. And There have been no other speakers of the vote for uh, proposed amendment number two as shown on the board. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving on to amendment number three, Alderman James. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. The, uh, do we have a second, please? Alderman Newington. Uh, Mr Mayor, I uh, formally move the amendment as listed that with the exception of 16 Kent Street, which should be zoned general residential, 
that rezone the rural living area B, two hectares zone land in Lindisfarne to low density residential. In saying that, Mr Mayor, uh, we have received a lot of correspondence from the applicants, from those that uh, submitted written submissions this evening. And that was basically on the, on the basis that this particular area in question <coughs> is in fact um, it's consistent with the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy because the land is contained within the urban growth boundary. Also, it's consistent with each state policy because the subject land is part of suburbia and has access to all services and is within easy commuting distance of the Hobart CBD. The land is not within a rural setting and not consistent with the purpose of the rural living zone. In one of the representations that we received, and there have been a couple from uh, representatives in that immediate vicinity, one of whom has said, and I quote, I trust that in view of the points I've made, you would seriously consider the rezoning of our rural residential land to low re uh, density residential as requested in the submission by all property owners of the ridge. I, and I'm, I'm quoting again, I believe the future urban zone is meant for land that is not already identified as urban and land that lacks urban services. The Lindisfarne Ridge area is direct, already fully serviced and well and truly within the urban growth boundary identified by the Southern Regional Land Use Strategy and is already designated as an area for urban de-densification, de uh, uh, unquote. Now, there has been a lot of discussion in relation to this area of land, Mr Mayor, over the years. And as long as um, five years ago, there was agreement that the change was needed, but the nothing has happened since. Now is the opportunity for Council to support those represent uh, representatives and make the necessary changes so that we can uh, assist in moving ahead. And therefore, I, I request Council support to have uh, uh, the submission for uh, rezoning, uh, and that is obviously, as mentioned, rural living area B, two hectares, to zone land Lindisfarne to low density residential. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, I think uh, all of the chimes there you know, covered most of the main points there. I mean, the only other thing that, going back to the uh, the natural justice issue here, I think this, this one area is one where We've seen that the overwhelming support by the landowners in this area is to actually um, support this amendment to allow them to to uh, to uh, you know change the land to the uh, you know more of a residential focus and, and the uh, and that's something that uh, you know people obviously want to live in these locations you know the urban growth boundaries there the services are there and I can't see any reason why we wouldn't support this one. Um, the other thing is too I mean with with the, the I know some the council staff raised the issue of the master planning issues and some things about you know transport and. And, and having something worked out. I mean, I know we need to look at all those sorts of things, but we've still got the opportunity to look at that. But this is one step forward in the whole process to allow these people to start that that movement to actually um, to deal with it. And I think, you know, you know, if I lived up in there now, I mean, I've read some of the um, the feedback from some of the um, uh, submissions that have come in. I mean, it seems like um, you know the rules have changed so often up there in terms of them thinking they can do what what they're asking to do here, and then the planning scheme change. And you know. I mean, I think you know what we've done to some of these people over the years is, is certainly not fair, and I think uh, you know we owe it to them now to give them a chance to uh, to move forward and get on with it. You know because of all the other reasons that I've already raised, I think most of some of the other alderman have raised as well. So I strongly support everyone to support um, this um, this amendment. Thank you, other speakers, Lord Bromley, and then Alderman Pearce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, um, this the amendment for us this evening seeks to change the zoning of Lindisfarne Ridge from rural living B to low density residential. And like so many of the amendments uh, we will consider this evening, this matter, as Alderman James outlined, has been considered by this council previously. And it is my sincere hope that tonight we make a decision that enables our city to grow and not merely yet again kick the can down the road. The 1998 council report titled Flagstaff Gully Local Area Plan identified the area before us this evening for future, future residential development some 22 years ago. And in that time, Mr Mayor, there have been a number of ad hoc and somewhat 
idiosyncratic uh, residings in the area. Tonight, in supporting the motion before this chamber, we have the opportunity to rectify the situation and deliver natural justice for all affected landowners. As we know, the subject land is well and truly within the urban growth boundary under the Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy and is designated as an area for urban densification. Now, one of the primary thrusts of the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy is to increase the density of fully serviced land in close proximity to key activity areas. Now, in this case, Mr Mayor, the land is part of suburbia. It has access to all services. It is close to both the Innisfail Activity Centre and the Rossby Park Principal Activity Centre and is, in, and is within easy community distance of the Hobart CBD with relatively easy access to public transport linking with both Rossby Park and the CBD. So in a strategic planning sense, this land ought not to remain underutilised. In fact, Mr Mayor, it is my firm belief that we have a duty, a clear duty, to ensure that this land is appropriately zoned. In addition, as evidenced by the rezoning of uh, uh, Joe Court and 13 Kent Street from rural residential to low density residential, and the rezoning of 166 Begonia Street and parts of 162A Flagstaff Gully Road from low density residential to general residential, Council has clearly adopted an incremental approach to this conversion over the years. Mr Mayor, to be blunt, I am more than slightly bewildered that this land is still zoned for rural living. It does not have limited services and is not within a rural setting, and moreover, it has absolutely no agricultural potential. In summary, the subject land is entirely inconsistent with the purpose of the rural living zone and must therefore most fittingly be rezoned low density residential. Uh, thank you, Mayor, but clearly now all of them all me has summed up everything I was going to say, so I'll support the motion. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, Mr Mayor, the officers have actually recommended that it's rezoned to future urban. And the really important aspect of that is that at present there's no structure plan that's been developed and that's required by the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use strategy to actually support rezoning. So whilst uh, there's a, a moderate likelihood of success as far as the low density residential is concerned, there's also the concern that there's an impact on the whole of the LPS. So I think the important aspect once again is that we are actually sitting tonight to look at strategic matters. And once again, I would say that we are not focusing on the strategic aspect if we actually, at this point, re recommend rezoning to low density residential. There needs to be a structure plan developed and that has not been done as yet. It needs to be done, and so until it is done, the officers are recommending future urban so that that work can actually be progressed. There is an aspect in relation to natural justice, although some other organisations said there isn't. I think it's important to keep in mind that when aldermen talk about that the community want this or the community want that, we actually have had only a small number of representations. For instance, with this one, we've actually had four representations. There's a lot more properties than four in this particular area. So that aspect of natural justice and the way that the officers have defined it is important. And therefore, I will not support this particular alternative motion. Thank you. Other speakers, all on the mic. Just rise on a couple of points. This area was flagged for future for intensification because it was identified as being suitable and available for increased intensification. 
if you actually see it, they could be going for general residential rather than low density residential, and it surprises me that that's not what it is. And the fact is, is that if, if, if the officer's recommendation for future urban, which is, you know, dealt with all this stuff, um, then you've got the situation where um, if they go for future urban, they could then come back with a general residential and the same provisions would apply. Now, the fact that they've gone for low residential is a, is a, is a choice of theirs to say we don't actually want cheap by jowl living in this particular area, but we want some space. So if we want larger blocks. So that's the issue about the intensification of future use. That there is no structure plan. We, will, we have heard and we will continue to hear that you can't move something into future urban if there isn't a structure plan. Well, here the officers are recommending exactly that. Moving into future urban without a structure plan in place. So um, you either, either need one or you don't. I would argue that you don't. And in any case, with this particular area, there are some uh, very, um, shall we say, comprehensive things that were called local area plans that exist in this area. That talk about the traffic and the maintenance of the vegetation overlays and all the things that are now modern and all that's required is for those plans to be revisited. And I would hope that it, that council has moved away from pushing those sorts of things onto the developers, but that the structure plans or the updated area plans would now be driven by council to make sure that the area is, it also suits the city as a whole and not just the particular landowners um, in that particular area. But I can say that the local area plan is in place. It exists. It only requires some updating. And if it's, um, and, 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 on, and on that basis, I think we should move with it. Now, we've heard about natural justice and, oh, we've only got four representations and that doesn't cover all the, the landowners. Um, I'm not sure that is correct. I think the representations are on behalf of all the landowners, which is why it is separate from the other zones. Be that as it may, natural justice is served when, because all we're getting now is comments on draft proposals. And the community will have an opportunity to comment should the Planning Commission agree with us. They will then not simply rezone it low density residential, they will probably go out and do further advertising if there are property owners who aren't affected by this thing. And that will be the case with the, pre with, with, with the, with the decisions we've made previously. So here's an opportunity, here's land that's been crying out for development for a long time, who everyone, um, everyone and his dog has said, we need to develop further, and, um, and uh, here we have an opportunity. Now, whether it goes into future urban, as the officers suggest, or whether it goes into uh, low density residential as what the, um, the owners request. I think that um, if we are concerned about over intensification of uh, some of this elevated land, I think we should um, seize the opportunity and give the owners what they want, lest um, it goes to future urban and they have a rethink. <laughs> okay, other speakers. Case the motion. Sorry, Alderman Walker. Uh, thank you, Mayor. There's a lot of. Uh interesting amendments before us tonight. Uh, this is probably the one that I've struggled with the most. And the bizarre thing about this is that I've struggled in a way that I'm in pretty much large agreement with every, uh, every point that's been expressed for this tonight. I am. Uh, and I, I think I understand the, the impact of the residents uh, feeling and I'm very sympathetic to that. And I think advancing it is important because at the moment it is a pig in a poke. If that was going to be a zone for an area of land in the city, that's what this one would be. Because it's so within the, you know, the, the inner and intensive sort of urban uh, activity area and yet some of it's rural and some, some, some of it's low. Um, so what, why I'm agonising so much on this isn't because I don't think it should be um, what troubles me is the thought that it doesn't get advanced, the thought that it stays in this current form of a logical limbo. Um, when we last considered this, uh, I think probably behind Alton Jones, I was the, the number one um, government.
Johnson and John make the change happen. We were, we were uh, resoundingly uh, ineffective at getting at convincing our colleagues that night. I wouldn't, uh, James must have been uh, uh, not being sure. So this is this is the this is the agony for me. Irrespective, um, I'm foreshadowing that we uh, our motion at probably our first council meeting in September that we, we put on the table the prioritisation of the structure plan for this site because um, if you step back, I, I suspect a lot of it would and should probably sit in the general residential. I suspect and and I have heard that there is there is aspirations. That, that, that elements of this from the landowners do, that, that however, there's a feeling that, that low density is the achievable rather than necessarily the element. So this is, this is some of the conundrums, but uh, it does really trouble me the idea that um, a, a submission might, uh, might go forward for perhaps low density and, and not get accepted because it's just highly, highly problematic the way it is. I really want to see it uh, advance. Um, I lived in Robin Court. I know the area through that. In fact, um, there was a school pretty much adjacent to that area, which I went to for four years. And uh, yeah, I remember a working bee with perhaps some of those people there 40 years ago. It, it, you know, change has been a long time coming. And the agony for me, uh, and what haunts me in this decision process is, are we inadvertently, and for the best reasons, actually <laughs> set something in place that might actually other speakers. In that case, the vote, uh, the, the motion before the chair is as depicted on the screen. It's amendment uh, number three. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Uh, first amendment number four is Portman Mullins. Do we have a seconder, please? Uh, Alderman Newington. Yeah, would you take the chair for okay. I too would like a water management break, but I guess I'll have to wait. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Chair. Um, this particular uh, motion is very similar to the last one, except it's um, the, the land occupied is actually, the, the land being proposed is actually. Uh, adjacent to existing general residential. So the other one was a proposal to go to low density. This one is, a, is a, to mo move from the proposed low density to general residential. And the real reason for that is that if you have a look at the uh, properties neighbouring them, um, the kind of development, the topography, the land, uh, the, the, um, the, the natural values, all those uh, bits and pieces that go into uh, determining an appropriate zone are already <coughs> met by existing houses that are in the general residential zone. And it would be really, um, it would be really unfair, I think, that if we move this, uh, this land, which is, um, di which is slightly different to the stuff on the top, of, on, the, on the major parts of the ridge, which we've just discussed, but uh, is actually down there, um, and significant parts of it have already been zoned general residential, uh, and that, uh, referring to what Alderman uh, uh, Walker was on, was, um, you know, these are these incremental bits and pieces that we've been engaged in for some time and it's really time we bit the bullet and said, no, um, let's move that, let's make it available um, and, and in this general residential um, area you have the capacity. Now when we talk about the housing market and, um, and it's been referenced that, um, you know, uh, people in, in desperate need of affordable housing aren't going to be um, rushing into these uh, expensive blocks and that's true. But that's not the way the market works. What happens is, is you create supply, people who are on the up and up who are secure financially move out of uh, lower value houses and upscale to higher value houses, creating a gap at the bottom end of the market where people can come in. Um, and so uh, you're increasing the supply of affordable housing by moving the current occupants out of that housing into these higher area housing. So that's how the market works, that's how supply and demand works. And, uh, and that's how that's what we should be facilitating. So um, I'm supportive. I would uh, urge support for this uh, motion. Alderman Newton. Oh, fine, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. Other speakers? Alderman Walker. Look, 
should it be general residential? I expect so. Mm -hmm. I expect so. One C Robin Court, what was I? 13 Robin Court back in the house in the early 90s. <laughs> um, my problem is we don't have the structure there. That's what I was talking about before, wanting to actually get done with certainty, to actually make this happen, and I'd be foreshadowing ways that it actually would look at that to do that reasonably <coughs> so the connections can be identified to actually make this happen. Mm -hmm. Again, my concern is <coughs> that the road to limbo and inaction is, is probably marching ahead without that in place. Uh, so I totally support the vibe. I just think the way to get there isn't going to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is there a structure plan? No. However, as we know, Mr. Mayor, Lindisfarne Bridge area is already fully serviced, well and truly within the urban growth boundary, and is already designated as an area for urban densification. So it seems to me that the only stumbling block compromising its potential for urban, urban use is the way this area has been defined, incorrectly I submit, in the planning scheme by the provision schedule. Mr Mayor, as outlined in the submissions on this matter, issues pertaining to zoning and possible specific area plans were all addressed to the Planning Commission more than five years ago. Although I was not on council at that time, Mr Mayor, I understand that there was agreement and that change, that change was needed. However, here we are, five years down the track, and nothing. Nothing appears to have happened to enable this matter to be appropriately progressed. So, Mr Mayor, to me, the answer here is quite simple. The subject plan from Flagstaff Gully extending along Lindisfarne Ridge to Begonia Street and including 1C Robin Court, 164 Begonia Street, must be rezoned from low density residential to general residential. Simply put, Mr Mayor, this is the right thing to do, and I urge colleagues to do the right thing. Hello, uh, Mr Mayor, I share Alderman Walker's concern. Uh, it may be that, in essence, we get nothing. Um, unless we've got that structure plan, and it's very clear that Alderman Walker can see the issue of concern here. I note also that whereas the previous alternative motion actually has uh, a likelihood success is moderate. Um, this one also has that likelihood of success, but once again they are both linked together in terms of that there needs to be the structure plan before we can move to the desired zone. And that is why the officers have actually recommended what they have rather than general residential. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other speakers? Alderman Pearce? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, so I support this to general residential. Um, I think uh, Alderman Walker is quite right. We don't need a structure plan. I'm congratulating for saying he's going to bring it, bring it forward because look, this area is bounded by general residential anyway to virtually you know, the, to the west, southeast. And so really, I'm a bit like some others. I thought this may have been picked up before, but it hasn't, but hopefully this time. Other speakers? I've been the motion for the Chair is as depicted. Um, all those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving on to uh, amendment number five concerning a rural living lot size Gilston Bay, uh, Auburn Muller. Mr Bear, this um, is uh, a very similar situation uh, where uh, we have an area of land uh, in the hillside uh, compared to the others uh, where we have um, um, two hectare lot sizes and can I say that can I just ask for a second oh, before we move forward? Alderman Jones, thank you. 
on a lot of things. Yeah, so, so it's um, in a sense, it's the same. It's very similar to um, Acton and, San and uh, Sanford. Um, the fact is that this particular area, uh, which is known as Government Hills, from a very early um, stage, I think, because no doubt it overlooks the original uh, Bowen Cove settlement. Um, that the um, the area is. Uh, Fairly large um, in terms of uh, hilltop, um, residential stuff. And the thing is that two hectare blocks in proximity to the cities is a bit of a rarity. You don't have to go too far out. Uh, even, um, I think Brighton is characterised by many, many one hectare blocks. And they're out in the area. If you ever said, you know, that there's an area where that needs to be that larger size blocks, it would be in places like Brighton. Yet there they are with one hectare blocks all over the place, and here we are with none. But this particular area, um, I don't think it's, um, you know, it, it's a, an appropriate area. It's, uh, you know, um, and not all the landowners have been consulted, so there is. And I think this is where, when we say, oh, you know, it's a low or moderate or high impact on the LPS. No, it's not. If you look at the requirement, it's the impact implementation of the load of the LPS is that's being impacted. And in cases like this, there would be a moderate or high impact on the LPS if this modification was to uh, meet with some favour, because the implementation of the LPSs would be slowed down by the fact that we would have to re-advertise and we would have to put out to community consultation the proposal, which, was diff which is a different proposal, on which they were consulted before. So until that stage, we really won't know what the, all the other landowners who are involved in this and all the others don't do it. But as a matter of principle, this is an appropriate area to come back to one hectare lots. So that if, there, if, the, if the desire is there um, for these particular areas, uh, we're not talking about intensification because the land and the, and the topography doesn't suit that. But we are also looking at the capacity for owners on a case-by-case -case basis, if they wish, to increase the density of land and in such proximity to the city, we are indeed blessed that people can have one hectare blocks of land so close to the GBO or the city. Thank you, Alderman Jones. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, some years ago, um, I supported and a number of members of this council supported the application for the Clarence Lifestyle Village and that abuts, of course, Pipers Road, which is, I believe, quite relevant in relation to this particular matter. And also, too, this council is, is well aware of the changes that the Department of State wrote and the council and the owners of the Clarence Lifestyle Village are signing up to making substantial changes to that intersection at Pipers Road and also the road widening that will happen very soon and council is putting a lot of money into that as well as the development of Napier Road uh, uh, that's, again, another road access off Piper's Road. So all that development lends itself to, obviously, making a change to what currently is uh, zoned rural living on a two hectare lot to what is being proposed this evening to uh, area A, one hectare. So it makes sense to me that really, with this development, with the developer at Clarence Lifestyle Village and the developer that is actually uh, selling lots off Napier Road in the uh, Gilston Bay area, that you have to move with the times, you have to have these changes because already there is that development in that area and therefore there needs to be a change to one hectare lots. I like to quote again uh, on, um, in relation to this and that is this particular change is consistent with each state policy because most are in, inapplicable while water quality and management can be addressed through the installation of reticulated services and conditions as appropriate. It's also consistent with the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy because the land is contained within the urban growth boundary. And I mentioned that a moment ago as far as the development of the Clarence Lifestyle Village and the development that's occurring in Napier and also the uh, joint venture, if you can say that, between the Department of State Growth, the Clarence Lifestyle Village um, uh, Development, and also the Clarence City Council. 
So it's consistent with, this, with rules because the land is contained within the urban growth boundary. And more importantly, Mr Mayor, it's consistent with guideline number one, the local provision schedule, LPS zone, and code application, and consistent with the neighbouring residential areas. And I've just mentioned that. And it can be connected to reticulated water and sewerage, and is not highly constrained by hazards or natural values or other imp impediments and any other issues that can be taken um, with appropriate management plans. I see council support. Thank you, Alderman James. Just to clarify, um, the screen's actually got amendment number four uh, up on the board at the moment. I understand the computer doesn't have amendment number five in it? Uh, no, it doesn't. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I've just realised that um, I've got two amendment uh, fours and I'm missing amendment five. So. Uh, I've checked and it's within your notes, so they're correct. Uh, having said that, everyone should have amendment number five in front of you. I was confused when having yeah. 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 Uh, Sorry for any comments. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are, just to clarify, talking about mooted amendment number five, dealing with rural living and lot size, Gilson Bay, Risdom. Okay, uh, so we've had a move and a second to speak. Are there any other speakers, please? In that case, uh, I'll put the motion, which is not on the screen, but in everyone's notes. <laughs> All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving on to mooted amendment number six, which uh, deals with uh, 424 South Arm um, Lauderdale and 25 Acton Road, Alderman Mulder. Do we have a second for this? Um, thank you. I'll take Alderman Gomley. Um. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think one of the problems with this particular area, and both lots are owned by the same, uh, <coughs> the same owner, so um, we, we're really talking about a parcel of land in two titles, uh, with two addresses, but um, owned by the one owner. Um, the land is bounded on all sides, or on three of its four sides, by... Um, by, uh, by uh, zones that aren't part of what is mooted in the LPSs. And in fact, one of the problems with this particular block of land is that it's been lumped with the whole um, enlargement of Lauderdale as such. And as we are about to uh, discover once again, no doubt, one of the big issues there will be what do we do with the inundation. Um, it's unfortunate that this particular block of land has been carried along with that. And it's been carried along with that in uh, the original zoning was um, something like um, flag for future uh, residential development. But um, then when a planning scheme came along, the whole area that was, um, was zoned something uh, else was switched to rural living as almost a holding pattern until we worked out what we were going to do. This block has been lumped in with that and it shouldn't be. This block is elevated. It is between a, uh, between a school, which is a community purpose, which is what the owner seeks the zone to be, and next door is a commercial zone. There is every possibility that um, you know that uh, once this land is rezoned, the education department may be very keen to expand its current holdings at Lauderdale which are zoned community purpose, because one of the community purposes could be a school, or it could be residential um, um, lifestyle village, uh, you know, retirement village type, type arrangements. So the landowner has gone through uh, great trouble and has um, engaged his separate planning advice because his is a different issue. So I've, in, in, in putting all this together, and I know that for simplicity we decided to merge them all into areas, I have taken the point, though, and in consultation with the uh, representer, to say this is different, this is inequitous, that it be left lumped with other land which has different issues to ones that with this one. So um, without going too much more into it, all I can say is that if you're bounded on one side by, um, if, sorry, if your boundaries are two sides major highways, your neighbour is, uh, is, is an education department school which is a uh, uh, community purpose and next door to you is um, a commercial district which currently contains offices and is mooted for an entire supermarket, would you believe, and shopping centre. Um, surely um, 
you know, we can see the sense that this land should not be rural. It should be have some uh, either residential or community purpose uh, component. And the landowner is very keen to make it community purpose so that um, um, he can proceed with, uh, with taking advantage, as I said, of a piece of land that um, has uh, no need for a structure plan because it has accesses on, access onto two roads. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that, um, that um, access to whatever goes there uh, it will be um, very easy. It's uh, inner reticulated uh, services, both water and sewerage, uh, good road access, um, not subject to uh, inundation any more than any other parts of uh, Clarence, but um, certainly uh, it's uh, capable of drainage and in such uh, some respects it's uh, better than some other parts of the city that are already generally residential. So I'd encourage support for this one. Um, as I said, it is different to the uh, other areas and I stress once again, its history has been because it's been lumped with the other issues in Lauderdale, which, and it, but it isn't bedeviled by the issues that those ones are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this 4.2 hectare parcel of land really ought to be open and shut case. The land is sandwiched between Lauderdale Primary School, which is own community purpose, and the proposed Woolworth site, which is own general business. The land is clearly identifiable as infield development. The land has both town water and sewerage. The land was originally within the urban growth boundary and only changed when the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy was modified to show existing zones without reference to future expansion. The land was zoned general residential but inexplicably, inexplicably <laughs> was changed to rural living. The implementation of the Clarence Interim Planning Scheme 2015 failed to achieve a like-by-like -like translation from the 2007 Interim Scheme. The land does not correlate with the criteria of the rural living zone, and the land has walking access to all facilities. Mr Mayor, the land in question was, in the past, part of the future urban expansion area of Lauderdale. Now, with the introduction of the Clarence Planning Scheme 2007, which did not contain future zones, the land was zoned rural residential. Now, this was an indication of, it, of its existing use rather than an indication of future strategic growth and development. In the development of the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy, the land was originally within the identified urban growth boundary. However, in amendments to the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy, the subject land was subsequently excluded as the urban growth boundary was modified to reflect current zone boundaries except for identified greenfield development areas. In the development of the Clarence Interim Planning Scheme 2015, the land was again identified as being appropriate for future development and was included in the general residential zone plan. However, because of the reduced urban growth boundary area, the final approval in the 2015 scheme then reverted to a like-for-like -like zoning to that applied in the 2007 scheme. As I learned earlier, the land sits between properties containing Waterloo Primary School and the neighbouring Early Learning Centre to the northwest and the existing commercial precinct directly to the southeast. The directly adjacent land to the southeast while currently vacant, is earmarked as a site for a future Woolworth supermarket. The subject land is also much less constrained than other rural living zone areas nearby, <coughs> as it is less affected for the potential of flooding or inundation. <coughs> Most importantly, whilst implementation of the, of the 2015 scheme was to deliver a theoretical like-for-like -like translation of the previous rural residential zone, the Clarence Planning Scheme 2007 allowed for a retirement village under the community living classification. Now, with this firmly uh, front of mind, it is apparent that the implementation of the 2015 scheme, or in the implementation of that scheme, the use of development potential for the subject land for development as a retirement village did not achieve a like-for-like -like translation from the previous planning scheme. Mr Mayor, to rub salt into the wound, retirement village is allowable use in both the neighbouring zones, 
being committed in the community purpose zone and discretionary in the general business zone of the state planning provisions of the Tasmanian planning scheme. Mr Mayor, in the interests of fairness and sound public policy outcomes, I urge colleagues to support this amendment so that the subject land may be rezoned, quite appropriately, from rural living to community purpose. Thank you. Other speakers? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I won't be supporting this alternative motion. When we actually look at the table of, that the officers have developed in relation to uh, assessing the criteria that they use for assessing, we see that this particular piece of land, pieces of land, uh, don't meet the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy, don't meet the State Coastal Policy, don't meet Guideline Number One. Also, the Council decision, which is the last formal Council decision uh, of May, 1st of May 2017, um, this was land which was within the feasibility study and Council determined that they did not, or it did not want to go ahead uh, with looking at the feasibility. So, from that perspective, that is our last formal decision as far as this land is concerned. Also, as has been pointed out, it doesn't meet the light for light conversion with the current planning scheme. And it's also important to note that with the feasibility study, the public consultation was very much that there were a number of residents uh, that were very concerned about rezoning within this particular area. So there are natural justice issues here. And I'd just like to read from the officer's report in relation to this. And it's in relation to the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy, Urban Growth Boundary. And that is the key in this particular situation. It says that the Land Use Planning Approvals Act requires that a local provision must be consistent the regional land use strategy. The site of Butts, the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy's urban growth boundary to the north, west, south, east, shown on map 10. Obstrals. However, the site is outside the Strauss urban growth boundary. And the densities provided through the development of a retirement village are comparable to those provided in the general residential zone. In fact, it's a higher density. So for this reason, it's not accepted that a retirement village could be anything other than an extension to the urban environment. And on this basis, is not consistent with the Strauss or our council's Lord and Lyle structure plan. And what is very important is it is noted before the proposed zoning would be acceptable under Strauss, it would be necessary to first amend Strauss's urban growth boundary. And this is an issue that we've been dealing with for years and years and years. And on the 1st of May 2017, Council's formal decision was we don't want to go ahead with looking at that. An urban expansion beyond the urban growth boundary is not only contrary to the Land Use Planning Approvals Act, I'll repeat that, not only contrary to the Land Use um, Approvals Act, but has broader implications for strategic, for strategic planning in a greater Hobart and is not Supported. So I can't support this. Thank you. Other speakers? OK. 
case of the motion for the chair uh, concerning 424 South Arm Road and 25 Axton Road to uh, rezone to uh, from rural to community purpose. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving on to move to amendment number seven concerning the Lauderdale Rural Living Rezoning. Alderman James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, well, I have a second, sorry. Uh, thanks, Alderman Newington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, the matter in relation to this um, has been uh, spelled out in the officer's report, but at the same time, the report that was referred to um, as part of the 2016-17 feasibility study uh, went into some depth in relation to it. But since then, time has passed. In fact, we are now in 2020. A number of those comments and recommendations that were in that feasibility report have not been um, basically followed up. And therefore, that movements at the station, if you want to use that term, have occurred and there is also now, I believe, enough support, particularly from those people that are seeking changes to, to the zoning. And, and I'd like to quote in relation to the objectives of Schedule 1, because Schedule 1, and it refers to the fact that the site is well serviced with both civil, social, infrastructure and public open space, Cultural heritage values exist on the sites, but not a constraint to development. And the objective set out in Schedule 1 are also um, concerned or referred to under Schedule 1 as it facilitates economic development. In the, um, the report that was prepared by um, JMG, and that's with regard to the Lauderdale Urban Expansion Feasibility Study, and it is again as, as referred to by the um, independent report that was prepared by De Juris, Stokely, Cal, Kingston and Brendan landowners. And in that, the GHD report of October 2018, which is a couple of years later, uh, was commissioned and it was possible that their lands independently could be developed and, if possible, an efficient uh, method to develop the site. And I quote, it's also noted that the GHD report was commissioned to investigate the land at several, but not all of the properties represented in this submission, as well as several additional properties as detailed in the chart four. And the commission report uh, by those landowners and GH&D stated that the JMG report underestimated land sale prices and did not take into account any future increases in land prices. Also, the um, JMG report uh, construction costs were overstated. Filling was at a cost of $20 cubic metre, which could be substantially less at five, and the subdivision cost per lot was 50,000 compared to what they had actually stated. The point that I'd like to make is, in fact, the request for future uh, bourbon has a long way to go. It has a long way to go because there are a number of other, what we call, legislative mechanisms that need to be considered. There's the Urbage Urban Drainage Act of 2013. There's the Local Government Act of 1993. There's the Local Headworks policies. And there's also part five of LUPA regarding, and there was an example in the Meander Council example provided for infrastructure provision. Now we've all read that uh, email that came out today in, re in relation to the part five. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this change to future urban has a long way to go, but this council, by establishing the groundwork and, and advocating that it needs to change, it has the existing services on the 
basically adjacent to any of this development. And also, Council has agreed to a rezoning of a small parcel of land in Manata off Ringwood or Ringwood off Manata. And that is basically a small development that has been obviously rezoned. And then you're talking about the other area of land which abuts it. And that isn't even being considered for what may be a, a worthwhile development of future, of future urban down the track. It just seems as though that this particular development has not been considered in the long-term strategy of this council. It's okay to do a feasibility Thank study. You know, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, this one obviously has been, uh, you know, around for a while, and, and I mean, look, I, I look at, you know, it's a bit of a complex one for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, the issue is that it's gone from uh, future urban to, to not, but the previous, previous planning scheme changes, and, you know, I think we've all had plenty of contact with the people involved in, in, in this process down here. I mean, the bottom line is, um, we can't leave it as it is. You know, I mean, pretty much the whole swathes of the land through Lauderdale is pretty much an open drain. Um, and, you know, we have a responsibility either way as a council, we're going to have to deal with that at some stage in the future. And I know there's been some officers reported and, and Alderman that have been around for the last uh, time this was looked at as part of the old JMG report. Um, we are going to have to spend some money down there at some stage to do some work down there to, to deal with some of these drainage issues that, that need to be sorted out. But the thing about this is if, if we rezone it to future urban, well then that's some light at the end of the tunnel for these guys to actually get together and cooperate a little bit better, um, which has and hasn't happened at different times up through the journey, to actually come up with some creative solutions to actually deal with these issues moving forward, which will end up improving the, the, uh, the situation for the existing residents of Lauderdale by giving them some, some, you know, looking at the whole suburb in relation to some of the inundation issues and drainage issues that they face. Um, it, it, it gets rid of a hole in the middle of a, a community which is pretty much doesn't match the rest of the community. And there seems to be, you know, the fact that there's an urban growth boundary around the middle of it that says no, that, that's not part of the boundary, I mean, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the fact is that people want to live in these areas, people want to live near the beach. And we should be giving people the opportunity to live in areas where they want to live. And, you know, having lived down there a few years, I mean, I know why people would want to live there. I mean, it's a fantastic community of the beaches. Um, and the community itself is, is such a great place to live for a variety of reasons. Um, the thing is too, I mean, the cost to council in relation to, um, you know, and I wasn't convinced that the costs that were quoted um, would actually be as high as they are, but the bottom line is we would have to spend the money anyway. And the reality is that this way, by giving the, the green light to the, uh, to the owners to actually take this further, it gives them the chance to actually come up with solutions where the cost is shared with the, the, the people moving into the community rather than being left solely with the, the uh, residents that are in that area now. And I don't think that um, you know, is, is something the council would welcome and, and whether the residents would welcome that as well. Um, you know, I mean, obviously with more houses through that area, there's more rates revenue for the council and, and you know, we, um, we would benefit from that as well. But you know, the, the other argument where it's, uh, you know, regardless of whether any development that happens, council incurs extra costs as well. Um, and we do, because we've got to consider um, any changes to, a, to an area where there's a new subdivision goes in. We always incur extra costs, but we recoup that in extra rates revenue down the track. Um, I mean, one of the issues where uh, you know, a couple of the landowners have come up with some creative solutions to create, create extra drainage using parts of the property to drain into the Lauderdale Canal. Um, you know, and I think that shows some of the um, things that will ha hopefully happen through the process of, of this moving <coughs> forward, where they actually, like I said, can come up with some creative ways you know, to fix the issues. Um, but look, I just think that doing nothing is just not fair to anyone, in terms of certainly not fair to the, the people that want to want to progress this further. It's not fair to the people that want to live in this area. It doesn't make sense to us as a council to say no, because that really isn't an option. We need to deal with the drainage issues. And I just think, you know, it doesn't actually, even though, I mean, there was an argument put forward today and some, some correspondence that said it commits us to doing something, you know what I mean? On one hand, I, I agree that by us zoning it future urban, it, it does, but it still doesn't commit us 100% to actually move it all the way forward. We still have the opportunity if we don't like what happens, or there's something that pops up, we have a chance to address it then. But saying no, I don't think is an option in this situation, and I strongly encourage my uh, fellow Ottawa to support this, this proposal, because 
um, it's this this potential for wins certainly outweighs um, you know any benefit by by saying no and just leaving it as it is. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak to this uh, and hand the chair to the deputy mayor. Um, I, I'm not in favour of supporting this amendment, and let me explain why. Um, first of all, to go back a little bit, the Eastern Shore Planning Scheme of 1986. In that, the area was indeed reserved and zoned as reserved urban. It was then identified as subject to inundation. The principles of development control for the area also stated that the release of the Lauderdale area in the future for urban residential expansion will be dependent upon the provision of sewage and stormwater services and the investigation of the effects of possible rises in sea level. Then, 2007, under the Clarence Planning Scheme, the area was indeed back zoned to rural residential, essentially because there was no provision in the scheme for future urbanisation to be identified as a zone. So, my starting point is, and in principle, I have some sympathy with the landowners who would like now to see it re-identified for future urbanisation. I think that destiny is there. Indeed, I, and along with an, a majority of aldermen, voted in favour of the council rezoning the land to general residential under the draft interim current planning scheme in 2015. The planning minister of the day rejected that rezoning recommendation from council, but confirmed the government's desire to see the Lauderdale structure plan updated and the necessary changes made to the Stralis. The subsequent studies, which cost the ratepayers of Clarence north of $250,000, identified considerable financial risk to council should it continue to support a rezoning. And on that basis, it decided not to proceed. I accept the business case may well have changed with the change in prices of land and differently identified construction techniques. The development may well now be viable. However, even a decision tonight to rezone the area's future urban will create the expectation that Council now intends to progress the urbanisation pathway, knowing the financial risk. And it is not true to say that we're up for the costs anyway. The costs are extraordinarily higher than they would simply be for us to improve the drainage system down at Lauderdale at the moment. It is widely accepted as a principle that the cost of preparing land for development lies with the developer, not the community. The proper way forward here, and the right way forward, is for the developer to embark on a normal process rather than lobbying to have a rezoning parachuted into a new planning scheme. The normal process would involve applying for a change to the urban growth boundary, as we had at the last council meeting for another application, applying for a zoning change, and then applying for a subdivision. Each step would require justification from the developer, but more importantly, a demonstration that there is a viable pathway to prepare the land for development. While I remain sympathetic to the future urbanisation of the land in question, Tonight's proposed amendment is not the appropriate vehicle <coughs> for change. I cannot support the amendment because of the apparent and evident risk financially to the community of Clarence. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other speakers? Order the peers. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I'd like you, I'd love to see a certain people down here this change, but like you, I have serious reservations. Now, most of the aldermen have seen one report, possibly two. We've had report after report after report after report. There's at least a page and a half of reports on this. And I'm afraid to say, like you, you I know there's going to be a very risky high cost to council. Now, people can say, oh, yes, you know, the price of land goes up and everything else. But it's a very, very risky area at the moment. And I agree with you, Mayor. There is an alternative way to go. And I think that's more, more appropriate than council laying out. And what was it, $10, 11 million dollars we said in 2016? It could be higher than that now. So this really does concern me. 
It really does. Um, you know, when I read this, I mean, I can see things that it certainly worries me when I read the report. Now, look, it, like you said, me and I would like to see for certain people this progress, but I'm not going to support it under the way it is at the moment. I certainly agree with you that other aspects of the development can bring to us, and I think that's the way to go. Thank you, Councillor. I thought you had, I thought you'd move forward to speak. I'll move forward so that my eyesight is broken. <laughs> okay, I didn't realise. So no okay, uh, Alderman Warren. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I haven't used up too much of the Council's time this evening. Mindful of Alderman Mulder's comments at the beginning that all we are doing is making recommendations and the planning scheme Planning Commission rather will make the final decision but I feel I do need to speak on this one um, and um, at the risk of quoting um, one of my colleagues at the last meeting made a very forceful statement that we um, as a board of directors I don't necessarily accept that um, title um, because we're voted in rather than appointed but as in our responsibility um, we appoint the right people to the job and we trust their judgment and we've been advised very strongly by our general manager of the significant financial risk to Clarence should this go ahead and that we would be obliged <coughs> to spend money um, and it is true that we we would be making that commitment whether we wanted to or not um, tens of millions of dollars good luck recouping that in rates I think that that's a very unrealistic um, expectation but I guess my biggest sticking point is that if we change um, and if the TPC accepts our recommendation and changes this to future urban, we are giving false expectations to future purchasers. And I'd hate to be in the situation where the current landowners sold their property onwards to somebody who might reasonably believe that they were going to be able to develop that land. So I cannot support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, with the... Uh running the risk of identifying myself, it seems I have to be as forceful tonight as I was last time. Because simply put, from my perspective, it just does not make any sense to have central Lauderdale outside of the urban growth boundary. Absolutely no sense whatsoever. This area is surrounded by a residential zone. And it is important to remember that this land was originally zoned reserved residential. The amendment before us this evening provides an opportunity to restore that original status. And importantly, even if we support this uh, amendment, there is still a significant amount, a significant amount of water yet to flow under the bridge <laughs> before any change of use occurs. Excuse the pun. <laughs> to be clear, Mr Mayor, tonight's decision does not in any way, shape or form bind the ratepayers of our city to outlay any funds. And Mr Mayor, those that seek to peddle this misinformation really ought to have a good, long, hard look at themselves. Alderman Blomley, I think it's wrong to cast aspersions on the motivation behind people. Could you please confine your comments to the issues at hand rather than purported reasons why people might have made them? Mr Mayor, personally, uh, I must admit I was a bit surprised and disappointed by the reticence of our officers on this issue. Sure, we had a report from a number of years ago outlining issues with developing the land. But we also know all things have changed a lot since then, particularly, as you touched on, Mr Mayor, population growth and land values. The landowners and their developers have been very clear, crystal clear, in advising us of their unambiguous understanding that a significant amount of additional work has to be, to be undertaken to outline clear solutions to some of the issues identified by the JMG report. Surely, as a council, sitting as a planning authority, we should be finding ways to make things happen, rather than the exact opposite. On the possibility, Mr Mayor, of using a Part 5 agreement, as outlined by Mr Bradley from GHD 
and is already in use in the Ender Valley. I've read the general manager's advice, and perhaps I'm missing something. But I do not see any definitive advice saying that such a mechanism cannot be used. The argument that because our Part 5 hasn't been used by anyone else other than the Ender Valley, that it can't be used by us, is in my view illogical. Rather, I submit the reverse more logically applies. If it has been used by the Ender Valley without any problems, then surely that opportunity also applies to us. At the very least, I would argue it is worthy of more, much more serious consideration. To seek to dismiss this rezoning application without the benefit of definitive advice that a Part 5 agreement can't be used is premature and, in fact, is unfair to landowners in question. My final point, Mr Mayor, is to remember what we're doing here tonight. We are playing a role to put in place the new planning scheme which we can reasonably expect to be in place for a generation. All this uh, uh, amendment does is to provide the opportunity for a potential future change to a more intensive use. But if we fail tonight to rezone this land to future urban, we are likely locking it into its current illogical status for another 30 years. Mr Mayor, I commend the alternate motion before the Chair and I urge colleagues to support this very sound approach. Thank you. Other speakers? Point of order, please. Sure. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when we talked about um, disclosure of conflict of interest earlier, and, and I'm not sure if this is relevant, um, but I raise it at the estate of the Barakas family. I am aware that um, Alderman Blomley considers Simon Barakas to be a close friend. Um, um, what that means. I mean, look, 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 um, Alderman Warren, it is up to individual aldermen to declare an interest or not. It, it is not um, in our purview to question whether another alderman has a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you. So that's what I order, Mr Mayor. It is land brackers, not be brackers, who are the landowners here. My mistake. This is, this is Cassia Potter, Rick Lark. It's disgusting. Absolutely. I ask, I ask an apology, Mr Mayor. That was a disgusting... Uh, a uh, spiritual my character. Oh, 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 oh. And Adelaide Brackers family and the Brackers family. Thank, thank you. It's disgusting. I want to move from apology now. Uh, um, Alderman Warren has apologised. I want to put that to me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Alderman Blumley, I reservedly, unreservedly apologise. So are you sure? Alderman Blumley, please accept it without shouting back. But I just need a quick update on this. Oh, I'm being held. It's pretty simple. Warren Walker, seriously. Alderman Blumley. Um, there has been an apology. Can you please restore decorum? I understand that you had a right to uh, call a point of order, but, but there's place. no justification for shouting and yelling. You be careful. Any uh, action look, unbelievable. There's no reason for shouting and yelling and making accusations. We'll deal with it logically, calmly and professionally. Well, Mr Mayor, Are there any other speakers? Would it, be, would it be right? This is appalling behaviour. Look, uh, <laughs> Are there any other speakers? Unbelievable. Alderman Walker. Thank you. Um, should I appeal to the fire and say I consider myself a friend, not necessarily a close one of Simon Barakas, who's not going to tell us this tonight. Um, I think on this matter, I pretty much agree with the uh, viewpoints uh, predominantly so far that were raised by the Mayor. Um, it's a lot of history. Uh, on this issue and on this land, preceding my time on council, during my time on council, be it the previous, including the previous one and a bit terms, as well as this term now. Um, and what's been raised tonight include the 
the fact that um, the current state of the land is, is problematic in, in its current uh, consistency, and I, I accept that it's, it's not as as good as uh, as what potentially could be, but it's a really highly problematic issue. Um, going back to the history wars, uh, again, I don't necessarily have a lot of excitement saying this, but uh, probably number two on the enthusiasm stakes behind Alden and James, uh, sort of around the early term of the term before. Um, I was around proceeding and advancing, uh, trying to help this land uh, culminate to a better fruition. Um, because it's flat and level and it's close to services. And uh, I was very gung ho on, on getting a feasibility study done. And it was a fair chunk of money. And I think it was money well spent because um, we wanted to know what could be done. Um, but then as far as this issue goes, people talk about pre-COVID, post-COVID or, 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 or during. As far as my, my head space on this one, there's, there's pre-JMG and then there's post-JMG. Um, and I, yeah, is, I heard someone refer to it as the old report. Well, it's only you know, October 2016, so uh, I don't think it's aged that much. Uh, it's certainly very comprehensive. Um, and whilst there's some arguments around land values, some, some talks again in the GHD report around uh, you know, the cost of fuel, etc., um, those things might have changed. But I'll tell you what hasn't changed. Gravity hasn't changed. Inundation concerns haven't changed. Um, they're with us. And in some ways, perhaps getting more complicated. Um, aside from that, uh, I guess one of the points I make with this report is it's warts and all. It doesn't give any ifs, buts, equivocations. It doesn't say the data was provided to us and we sort of tried to you know, use what we had. It's, this is the lay of the, the land. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not without sin when it comes to the occasional little bit of cognitive dissonance in some area. It does occasionally creep up me from time to time. But I've got to say, if you want to see some Olympic cognitive dissonance around this table, what's really interesting to me are people that put their hand on their heart 10 months ago and said that we all as a council must right now declare a climate change emergency Amongst that rank are uh, people that are enthusiastically saying this land is ready and right to have uh, detailed housing put on it right now. That is some hardcore cognitive dissonance. Um, the part five issues have been raised by Alderman around the table. Um, and I listen to those matters and I listen to the elements around the Amber Valley. Um, but I don't or I'm not persuaded uh, that they are sufficiently um, over and above the advice that we received from the general manager today. Um, there are future liabilities that could be considered an unacceptable risk. And you know, whether you grew up in Clarence, recently moved here, lived here, raising a family here, working here, paying rates for investment property, um, if you genuinely intend to actually stick around this community, this wonderful community that I've had the privilege to be part of for some time now, um, who would be picking up the tab for the, the headworks and those significant things? It's, it's going to fall on the right face. So I'm not, I, I'm not unsympathetic to the frustration of the landowners. I'm not, and I, as I said, one of the keenest voices around this table in the pre JMG world. But I have that JMG report now, and I can't ignore the advice that it provided me. And that puts me in a position of being unable to support this operation. Thank you. Other speakers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I uh, try not to be too cognitively dissonant. Um, Mr. Mayor, First point is the urban growth boundary. We've heard the discussions about that. And, and, and it's flipping and it's flopping and, and, and the way it's gone forwards and backwards. There was also a comment that, um, you know, we can't put this as future urban um, when we know it's, uh, when, when we feel it may never be and that the land will be sold to someone with a false expectation that development is likely. 
sorry, that's exactly how the current owners acquired the land. They were under that apprehension, and then things changed. We talked about the urban growth boundary and how this council, hand on heart, on 27, May 2017, said, we don't want to review the urban growth boundary, we think it's satisfactory. Well, I wasn't on council in 2017, but I certainly was here in council in uh, late September of 2018, when this council, I think almost unanimously, uh, suggested that an urgent review was needed of the urban growth boundary, and that we would take that up with the uh, local governors, and we would take it up with the thing. So that was then, <coughs> this is now. And that's a recurring theme as we go through this thing. There has been too much focus on the history, and as Alderman Molly quite rightly puts it, there, is, there needs to be a looking forward to the future. These reports are all based on the assumption that we have to get rid of the water, the excess water that's going to come there. So because we, we, we pipe water in, but we don't have a capacity to pipe it out. I mean, I come from a country, um, I was born in a nation which is two thirds the size of Tasmania, contains two thirds of the population of Australia, and is actually the world's third largest exporter of agricultural country when a third of its land lies beneath sea level. So don't walk, talk to me about innovation and the fact that we can't do it. We're all talking about stormwater as if it's the only, only way of dealing with stormwater is reticulation. And these reports all are based on those assumptions. That the, you know, the gravity will take the water down. There is no other option. You know, we can't defy gravity. Yes, water does run up. And it's done ever since a person called Archimedes developed a screw which was capable of pumping water up into up, up here. And that is exactly what this area needs. We talk about climate change, and this area is subject to uh, potential inundation from sea level rise should that occur. Well, should that occur, this would not be the first city, and we can foreshadow that. We can look at engineering solutions to either detain stormwater and then pump it out when it's, um, you know, like when, when, when the capacity is exceeded. We can look at um, perhaps reusing that stormwater uh, to, uh, you know, for, for other purposes and, and moving it out. We have had stormwater detention proposals, and I talk about Worksworth Park when I was last on council. The plan there was to create a new sports field area there and to dig out and to drain that area there, which similar to Lauderdale, stuck in behind dunes, um, as a thing. The other thing with the topography of Lauderdale is that it is perfectly for the detaining water because it actually has a clay base. So between the engineering solutions of being able to remove water, between the engineering potential of, uh, of uh, insisting that houses, um, there's already a, 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 um, a, a, a high data there, or if you decided that houses need to be built on stilts uh, above a certain level, there may be even a day where nature decides that this will be a much mooted canal estate for Lauderdale. It doesn't have to be massive amounts of fill. It doesn't have to be, you know, that water has to naturally drain into the ocean. It doesn't have to be um, these things. We are really here going on about old assumptions and old reports. Moving this into future urban gives us an opportunity to look at ways in which we could innovatively deal with this piece of area, an area where many, many people want to live because of the lifestyle. So I'm just saying um, up front, no, we aren't approving general residential. In fact, future urban, it might even be no, low density residential. Or it might be that um, no one is prepared to stump up the money. Now, Alderman James was in the process of saying one of the things, we haven't settled the headwork policy yet. That's something that could come up. And if someone came through with a future urban and they came through with a rezoning proposal and our issues weren't addressed, then we could simply do it. We could simply refuse it. We could simply refuse to do the rezoning. Thanks, Alderman so, Mulder. Other speakers? Alderman Edmonds. Uh, thanks very much. <coughs> This one, lots to read, lots to talk about, lots to um, soak up, um, to borrow another pun into the mix. Uh, obviously, we had a, a moment there before, but the, 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 the points made in the debate, I think, have been outstanding. And, Mayor, I can say I've been 
see where, why you are where you are now would be why you made that response to the report, which we don't see very often. Um, I'll, I'll really cut my comments short because I think we're starting to get worn out. But um, you know, with, with the JMG, GHD, etc., um, I found myself scribbling down THV, which is too hard a basket. Um, <laughs> I um, am sympathetic to the arguments put forward by uh, Alderman Newington and Ira, etc., about this, about the fact that it's a recommendation. Yes, there's a pathway there that isn't great, and I appreciate the frank advice on that aspect. But I guess what what it brings me back to is that this is a recommendation to the TPC, um, and it, it's one of the first steps on the pathway towards something happening in this place. And um, so, yeah, to refer to the two hard basket, um, I just think that there has to be a pathway somewhere. Um, slam the door shut here. I'm not sure where that comes from. I, I, I appreciate your comments before on that. But so, yeah, sorry, I'm too But um, yeah, that's that's how where I've come to the, to my conclusion, and I appreciate everyone's contribution. Thank you, Paul and John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I won't reiterate what everybody else has, has said, um, but essentially for me it comes down to, yes, there may well be elegant engineering solutions. Yes, it may well be that the land price has gone up and the cost could be done a lot cheaper, but fundamentally this is the wrong way to go about this process. So, yes, perhaps in future this will become a residential area, but there's a much better way to do it and trying to put through this amendment into the LPS is the wrong way and I cannot support this. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, in 2017, I was the alderman who actually moved the officer's recommendation and at that time I was supported by eight other aldermen and two aldermen voted against the officer's recommendation. I think it's pertinent to actually just read out the officer's recommendation so that we keep in mind what that decision was all about. And I reiterate that it's the last formal decision by council in relation to this matter. And I totally agree with the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor that this is not the right mechanism for us to be re-looking at this. The recommendation was that Council decides not to proceed with the Lauderdale Urban Expansion Feasibility Study and accordingly decides not to undertake an amendment to the Lauderdale Structure Plan nor to seek an amendment to the Southern Tasmanian Regional Strategy Plan for the following reasons. The study shows it would not be financially feasible to undertake the development. The development of the area would unreasonably impact on the amenity of the area. There are significant constraints to the development of the area, including the availability of suitable fill as well as long-term regional traffic management implications. There are high risks and complex engineering solutions required to enable development to occur, and council would be liable for significant and unredeemable costs in the order of 11 million for the infrastructure and management costs alone. There is no adequate strategic land use planning justification for modifying the Lauderdale Structure Plan or the Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy. But Council advises the Minister for Planning of Council's decision and the reasons behind it. I think it's important to note the Mayor detailed that there was considerable funds put towards the feasibility study. It was not only Council that put considerable funds towards it, the State Government actually put funding towards it as well. And so, it was a matter that once the decision was made, the Minister accepted that decision. If we're going to re-look at this, we need to look at it in a strategic manner. We do need to look at the 
Southern Tasmanian Regional Land Use Strategy and the Urban Growth Boundary. We do need to go through that process. One of the important aspects that I've been focusing on tonight and reiterating what the officers have focused on is that aspect of natural justice. When the feasibility study actually went out to public exhibition, there were a number of representations put in. And many, many, many of those were actually against rezoning this land, this area of Lauderdale. So as far as I'm concerned, the process that we're going through tonight is not the appropriate process to look at this issue. We've had a climate change study done in 2009 which brought up a number of very significant issues in relation to this particular area. And that aspect of inundation cannot be overlooked. It cannot be just pushed away with the idea that there will be some miraculous engineering solution. We need to see the tangible evidence in relation to that. The other aspect that has not been discussed tonight is that there are a number of developers who are looking towards rezoning. If it was one developer, and that's what the feasibility study was actually focused on, even then there would be a number of difficulties and a very large cost to council. But with the issue of several developers... Um, well, everyone's spoken, so I'm going to put the motion at uh, number seven. Uh, proposed, a mooted amendment there. All those in favour? Against? The motion is lost. Moving on to um, number eight. It uh, concerns a site specific qualification regarding community living at 476 and 488 South um, uh, Highway, Alderman James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I uh, formally move that, uh, that motion and in doing so, suggest that it's um, in keeping with the uh, changes that is being advocated and I will seek council support. Thank you, do we have a second that? Uh, Alderman Newington, I think. Uh, Alderman James? Do you wish yes. to speak to it? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm quite happy to take it as uh, <laughs> well, I, I did. I, 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 uh, only to reiter reiterate the fact that we, we need to make these... Well, I think it, it makes common, takes common sense to see that this development needs to occur. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it, there has been some discussion. That there is a, a case of natural justice in relation to this, and that hasn't been at all um, uh, been any problems in relation to what other uh, and neighbouring uh, property owners have actually supported or otherwise. And, and that has been spelled out quite uh, strongly this evening as far as um, the natural justice and also how it, it, it falls into the particular criteria. I see council support. Thank you, Alderman Newton. Oh, I don't think there's much point rehashing all the arguments I put forward about why we <laughs> supported the last one. Um, I think we all, uh, you know, I think they're quite clear, but I'll, I'll be really interested to see how someone could vote yes to this and vote no to the last one, to be honest. Um, you, know, I mean, I've, you know, being new to this game and uh, first time through this process, it's, um, it's interesting, but yeah, look, uh, I think uh, something that obviously people want to live in that area and uh, if they can find a solution to build a residential village here and people prepared to support it, I'd uh, be very interested to see how they could justify voting for this and not the last one, but anyway, that's another issue. Anyway, thank you. Other speakers? Uh, Alderman Blumley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Mr Mayor, to be clear, um, the end question is too small for rural use and is surrounded by houses, a hotel, a retirement village, a shopping centre, 
the church. We know that there is strong, very strong interest from a significant national retirement village operator to develop villas on this site for the estimated construction value of $12 million. I'm sure we would all agree that Lauderdale, indeed, across the length and breadth of our great city, Mr Mayor, there is a dearth of retirement village offerings. The uh, amendment before the chair would complement the existing retirement village adjacent and create a wonderful lifestyle hub for Clarence. A hub and a lifestyle that I'm sure we will all be proud of. Mr Mayor, at the end of the day, this really is an issue that boils down to good old common sense. The common sense outcome is to approve the alternate motion, and I urge colleagues to do just that. Thank you. Other speakers? Honourable Mulder. Mr Mayor, this is, um, this is part of the area that we get decided as a group we couldn't do future urban with. Um, but what I would um, argue is that um, notwithstanding the arguments from before, that this is an area where a specific solution could be achieved on a small scale. In fact, it could be a demonstration of what is possible on this site. And the fact is, there is already a retirement living uh, village on one area. This is an extension of that kind of living. I see this as, a, um, as an exception to the rule, uh, not quite to the same degree as I saw the uh, 424 um, um, South Arm Road uh, exception, but it is an exception. And here is a case where it is at the um, shall we say, it's, it's, at, it's at the extremities where I've already developed land and surrounded by them, and I think that um, if we rezone this particular land, if we get if we grant this land, despite its zoning a uh, SSQ, then we would be only uh, doing what is occurring around it, but it would give us an opportunity to perhaps uh, test drive some of the engineering solutions on a smaller scale. So um, I'm, um, I am supportive of this, Anything we can do to increase the, um, the, the living and to uh, encourage a few more people to enjoy that magnificent lifestyle that those at Lauderdale enjoy, even those who used to enjoy it and ran away. Uh, but uh, um, I'm supportive of, uh, of the site specific qualification, um, and uh, even though Council may not wish to do a general rezoning. Thank you. Other speakers? Well, I'll need to uh, put the motion. Okay, it's uh, moved to amendment number eight. All those in favour? Against? One, two, three, four, five, six. The motion is lost. Moving to uh, amendment number nine for Cadinia Road Rural Living Zone to and lot size. Uh, Mullet. There, um, this one is one that the um, officers were proposing uh, rather than like for like um, at Cadena Road, Richmond Road, uh, to move it to um, rural B from its current agricultural stand. Uh, my proposal is to take it that one step forward in line with some other um, areas there. This area is so close to a small village, two hectares is unreasonable, I, don't, I think, as a lot size. So uh, one hectare, I think, is, is, is very appropriate. Now, um, I think that uh, the representations have made it quite clear. We've had some um, interesting issues and discussions with this land. Uh, contrary to, um, to a mistake that occurred earlier on, and I just want to make sure that we aren't laboring under the apprehension, this is the land back around Cadena Road and uh, Cadena Road and Richmond Road. It is not the land on Richmond Road where the owner actually uh, wanted to have a new zone rural living, um, but um, it was a bit hard to argue that it was unsuited for agriculture given the fact that he's planted a massive vineyard. So um, I haven't uh, pursued that particular one, but this one here, I think, is, is an appropriate area. It is even, it's closer to a little township, and two hectares is basically useless um, uh, for um, a lot of the people who want to, to do this area. So if the land was rezoned, Subdivision um, of, of the existing land into uh, you know, what was clearly uh, on the, on the uh, urban print of a 
recommendation that a site-specific qualification be created for the Rosney Hill Nature Recreation Area. And their reasoning is um, that the Rosney Hill Hotel Permit could not have been approved under either the state planning provisions, open space or recreation zones. Accordingly, without modification to the draft LPS, the Rosney Hill Hotel Permit could not be amended to the extent that could normally and reasonably be envisaged. An alternative proposal could not be approved and the proposal would need to be constructed before it could establish any non-conforming use rights. Now, this is a tricky issue because this is actually um, before the Appeals Board at the moment and I understand is not going to be um, heard until September. Um, so the um, community is appealing the decision to go ahead with this application. Um, the general manager tells me that if this motion is successful tonight, it will make his life very difficult and I apologise if that's the case. But my concern is if the appeal is successful, then this gives the green light to future developments. Um, but also it suggests to me that the decision was incorrect in the first place, in that if the current zoning um, does not allow um, this sort of development, and it says, un however, under the state planning provisions, the recreation zone does not provide for visitor accommodation beyond the qualification if for camping and caravan park or overnight camping area. So um, this seems to me to be retrofitting a decision that's already been made. Um, I can't endorse that. Uh, so um, whether or not it has a chance of success, it's a, um, an ethical um, matter of integrity for me that I can't... Um, condone something that is retrofitting a decision that may or may not be successful in the, um, the appeal. So um, I urge you to support this motion. Thank you, Alderman Mora. Yes, I, I have some sympathy for the idea that, um, that uh, you know, we're sticking something on, we, we're flat out developing this particular nature conservation area, which is actually a declared reserve, um, that the, uh, the old scheme allows but a transfer of like for like suddenly would allow them to do it. Um, and so therefore we're going to use a site specific qualification to make sure we can't do anything. I can understand the logics of it, that if the thing is approved uh, by the uh, developer, uh, worse still, if the um, planning appeals tribunal comes back and says, uh, no, you can't do this, but you can do something else, that suddenly we're uh, sitting here trying to uh, stick a backstop onto something that we uh, invest a lot of time and effort pretending to get it right. So I'm not about um, you know, trying to shut the, shut the door after the uh, halls have bolted. Um, I'm more about um, you know, supporting the principle. I do have concerns that site-specific qualifications like this are being used to get around the planning scheme. Um, and, and that may have been the intention of the minister and it may have been the intention of, um, of the, uh, the planning department. Don't make it right. Thank you, other speakers. Will and Jack. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's, it's, it is very interesting that uh, we have a uh, appeal 
in the pipeline, and that is, and we've been advised that it will be heard in September. Now, the outcome of that, we don't know. We do know that there was a number of representatives who opposed it, and there was a, an intense uh, uh, lobbying process that occurred during those months leading up to Council's decision. But what I find interesting in relation to this, and that's why I'm going to support this recommendation, is because the fact that, that if this gets up, it still has to get to the TPC for ratification. And between this time in this place and the appeal process in September 2020, and I don't think that the TPC is going to, and we're looking at August, September, October, November, and I, in my experience, these um, local area provisions, local um, provision schedules, they are going to take some time. And we may not even have a decision, or the TPC may not be able to convene their, um, their board to consider the LPS submissions until late November, perhaps December. And by that time, the appeal process has been convened, and this particular matter may be raised at the tribunal because it may be perceived that it's a way in which council is trying to sort of certify what they're trying to do and to make it a, um, a, a, a special specific qualification for Rosny Hill um, prior to the TPC making a decision on it. And I would have liked this matter to obviously um, not be put forward at this time because it seems as though that it can be misconstrued by the public at large that council made a decision, it has been appealed and there's been a lot of community concern about that decision and then on the next breath and the council is now trying to create a, a, an SSQ for the Rosner Hill Nature Recreation Area so that it doesn't appear to be um, outside what the purpose of that uh, recreation area is and by making a specific uh, qualification, site specific qualification, it really undermines I think what this organisation is trying to achieve. On the one hand, okay, take it to the appeal process, but on the other hand bring this particular issue into the, into the discussion when, as I said, the appeal hasn't been heard and the appeal tribunal may consider this as not being relevant because of the timeline that it's going to take in order to get uh, take it to the uh, TPC. I will support this recommendation because I believe we need to support it because otherwise we may be seen by the community at large that we are trying to sort of short circuit the system and, and be seen to sort of throw in this particular uh, qualification when we should not be. Thank you. Other speakers? Um, Walker? Yeah. <laughs> nah. Alderman <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Newington. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, first of all, I would uh, want to obviously put on the public record again, but it's quite, quite clearly on there that my strong support for the Rosny Hill development um, in general, I think, was a fantastic thing for the community uh, moving forward with some uh, creation of some uh, recreational space and improvements to a recreational space. And ever since that uh, decision was made by this council, all I've heard from everyone that I've spoken to is that they were so happy that we actually moved forward with this proposal and I've got it on the table to actually um, you know, have something that you know, the community can truly be proud of in relation to uh, what it will bring to the community and so many benefits. Um, look, this, you know, I mean, look, this, this is a political stuff, this, um, you know. Uh, look, I would ask you not to assign uh, well, uh, motivations. But if the mover is a member of a political party, well, I mean, it's a political start. I mean, I'm not saying it's a problem with that. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, all in Newington, please, let's just focus uh, on, look, on the yeah. issues at hand. Well, but, anyway, but look, but the bottom line is, I mean, this, you know, the, the comment was made that there was, um, the community was appealing. Well, I mean, some people in the community are appealing the uh, proposal, but I'm sure, like I said, I hear much more uh, positive feedback from the community um, in relation to the fact that we're moving forward on this. And I mean, you know, essentially I think it's, you know, a waste of our time and money to, to basically put this in for something that we've already approved and had a democratic process where we sat down and we went through all the process 
and cons, and we made the decision to support. And I think to uh, to put this in is, is a you know like I said, it's a waste of our time, and, and I think that we should uh, you know accept the decision that's been made and uh, and move forward. Any other speakers? So I might be supportive. <laughs> Um, Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I actually think this is what could be termed uh, a, a technical recommendation, if you like. Uh, and I, I'm just going to read one comment from the officers uh, after they've gone through and explained why the recommendation of the site-specific qualification they note, it is considered that the modification outlined above meets the section 32.4 tests on the basis that the controls reflect an approved development that will provide for significant social, economic and benefit to Clarence and the southern region. And so this is like um, a technical recommendation and from that perspective uh, I believe it should be supported because as Alderman Warren has noted we don't know the outcome of the appeal but we have to take into account that the appeal may not be successful and that the development will go ahead. And therefore, we actually need to make sure that the developers are not stymied to any great degree. So, from my perspective, it is very much a sensible and technical recommendation. Thank you, other speakers. Put the vote then, it says on the screen, uh, move recommendation number 10. All those in favour? against. Uh, the motion is lost. Moving on to number 11, which is concerned 450 Rugby Road, rezoning. Alderman James, do we have a seconder for Alderman James' motion? I'll take Alderman Newington was first. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I would just like to uh, clarify said earlier and in the uh, submission by Frances Beasley from um, the RA Planning and Environment she did say that uh, we do not support the proposed rural zoning of the land at 450 Rugby Road Cowra under the draft provisions. We propose the land be zoned general residential with the area containing the historic quarry site to be zoned open space for the number of reasons. Now, there is a history in relation to this and what has happened over the years is that the, um, the development was part of a proposal which I understand and I was a member of the discussion group with uh, uh, the Lynch family back in 2003 and at that time it was discussed that the Nichols proposal they would have access off Miranda into the development that was being proposed for Glee Hill in that area at the time. Also, the Department of Main Roads was involved in discussions and also facilitated the changes that were required uh, for the development of the quarry and, in fact, to have it rehabilitated. The quarry has been rehabilitated and the extent to which it has been rehabilitated is a credit not only to the Nichols family but also to the support that the Department of Main Roads has given to them on the basis that their closure or the road access to that particular property was to be closed and therefore developed. The other comment that I'd like to make in relation to this is that the, um, the site is suitable for general residential zone as it's lo located within the urban growth boundary and is fully serviced. It is envisaged, and that is where the open space uh, requirement and the, and, the, and the zoning for open space together with the rezoning to general residential comes into place, is because 
there is proposed, and this is part of Francis Beasley's proposal, that it is that 10 to 12 residential lots could be achieved, providing lots which are slightly larger than the minimum lot side in accordance to accommodate existing site constraints. So there is already that road access that, that the uh, Lynch family, which based in conjunction with the Nichols family, decided on having that access at the point where their proposal and there is access through uh, the development into the Nichols property. So it's been proposed that there needs, obviously there's going to be 12, 10 or 12, that's the proposal, 10 to 12 residential lots, but that, that the quarry be in fact uh, be zoned into um, open space. If by any chance we decide to restrict that, or in fact uh, make some changes to it, there, the fact of the matter is that the former quarry site has been rehabilitated and there are several examples of similar historic land uses being used for public open space, such as the former K&D brickwork site, Gibbon Street, Newtown, and the development resulted in high quality open space for the community to enjoy. So there has been considerable development in relation to this, and therefore there has been a lot of time and effort put in by the developers, and I'm talking about Glebe Hill, uh, on either side of that property, and to remain it in a rural zoning. This detracts from the whole question of why you would have a, a, a general residential in Glebe Estate and then in the Miranda Glebe development that is um, a general residential. So look, this makes sense and uh, I think that we need to consider how the two can be utilised, the zoning general residential and how a historic quarry can be zoned open space and they have done substantial work to make sure that's been rehabilitated and I seek council support. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I, um, I'm in strong support of this one as well. Um, I have got a full show, uh, I'll turn a motion if this one didn't get up. There were some issues raised and it was really only because of the issues raised in relation to um, the safety of the quarry that were identified in the staff report about safety and some management and maintenance of the quarry as a public open space but as Alderman James you know, indicated there, there has been some innovative use of these sort of locations in, in other places which have turned out to be really good um, uses of this sort of space and also residential ones. I mean if you look at um, you know, Salamanca Square that was pretty much a quarry as well and that turned into something that uh, I think we all enjoy as a community. Um, but really I think the, uh, the issue here is all, all the issues that, that are that being raised by the staff can be dealt with in, in future um, subdivision applications. And I, and I just look at it and think, well, you know, we, we're going to have houses that are really, some really nice houses being built right on the edge of the quarry on the uh, western side of, the, of this land that we're talking about. Um, you know, some, some really nice houses going up there. So it's got access from one side. You've got houses coming through from the, um, the Glue Hill side. You know, it just wouldn't make sense to leave this one sitting on its own. I think, you know, we need to give the, uh, the owners of this land an opportunity to, to, uh, to do something with it, which is going to give people a, a location, which, you know, we all know has got some fantastic views down the river. Um, and I would um, strongly support my colleagues to, uh, to vote in favour of this amendment. Um, and I think it would be um, you know, some land that would uh, you know, create a great space for someone to buy and build and move into. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll be supporting uh, this uh, motion as well, but um, also uh, I think the one that um, is foreshadowed should this not be successful. Um, but perhaps this is a question to be careful to ask for, you might just get it, because uh, I think this is probably an underdevelopment of the site, and I'm not particularly happy with the idea of split zoning on one title, and um, although it wouldn't be one title forever, but, uh, but the split zoning, and I'm a little bit concerned about the open space being a quarry face, which I don't think is actually um, <coughs> what the purpose of the open space zoning is. <laughs> Given the fact you've got to put a fence around it and um, and, um, and and block people from going there, so I don't know how <laughs> it's open space when it's closed off. But um, this is what the representatives wanted, and they have a particular vision for this particular plan. And there's no reason, of course, they can't come back with a different one later on. But um, I'll be supporting this. I, uh, I do have a few reservations, as I've mentioned. But in the end, um, this is a piece of land that has been earmarked as somewhere we're going to build houses one day. Um, 
from the year dot. Now, the, the, the extension, the, the work's been done on the rehab of the quarry. Now, it may not be up to scratch, but of course, that would be part of the um, development conditions that um, things be done, you know, uh, or completed to, uh, to the next level of standard to enable this to be done. But I think this is a case of just leaving it as rural living um, and waiting to come up. A structure plan isn't needed because um, the services are all there. It's a degraded old industrial uh, site. Um, it's a, um, it's the access is now being sorted out so that it's not off South Arm Highway, which was always a particular issue. Um, uh, and now the potential is for, the, for access from either side. And as I said, all the services are there. Um, I think it's, um, no matter what we do tonight, I think we need to uh, give some comfort that um, all their hard work, all their work they've done, all their issues uh, really deserve a hearing and we need to make a step forward on this one. I uh, wonder if I uh, hand the chair over for a moment, uh, just explore with Mr Lovell the question of uh, a split zoning on one title. Is that something that the Commission would uh, tolerate even or uh, is it within the rules to... to uh, yeah. Uh, Mr Ford. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, originally, the Planning Commission was reluctant to provide for split zoning opportunities, and their, their initial drafting instructions provided for one zone per cadaster. And we made a convincing case earlier on, and uh, as you drew your point, was the, the best example we could come up with, with very large land holdings that had different topological features across the site, it was inappropriate just to, to zone it one thing. Do you zone the whole hill general residential or do you zone it all environmental living? What do you do with it? And that, the position was accepted. So they ended up um, revising those drafting instructions and allowing you to stitch it a, a dual or multiple zones to natural features. So it was, became obvious you could do it to a, a, a creek way or a drainage swale or a particular contour. Uh, and it became... Um, they gave more and more guidance on it. So you can do it, they're reluctant to it, but you need to be able to justify it to a spatially mapped feature. So you, you could in this case, obviously if it was up to a quarry face, that could be readily identified, but they don't want it just to carve up a paddock. It needs to be something that a surveyor can come along and re-establish on the ground if necessary. Thank you. Take the chair back, I've got nothing further to add. Uh, Walker. Uh, this is an interesting one. I think that's the foreshadowed yeah, yeah. motion, if I'm reading it right. Yeah. Okay, other speakers? In that case, uh, I'll, I'll put the motion as presented that it becomes split zone. All those in favour? One, two, three, two, three, four, five. Against? Uh, the motion is lost. In which case?
case uh, for the mold. I think no, uh, no, uh, Alderman Newington had a foreshadow. Yes. Uh, if you'd like to detail that, please. Replacement and recommendation. What are we up to? Two, yeah, hang on. So much. Um, yeah, look, I suppose, I mean, if, if I take yeah, it. If I could have a second. Oh, yeah. yeah. Second to Alderman Mulder, thank you. Um, well, if we take into account um, Alderman Walker's comments there, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, obviously, if, if we did go down that path of wanting public open space, um, all, like I said, all those issues would have to be dealt with in relation to a seismic, geological, whatever type survey we need to do, we'd have to identify their own risk associated with it. Um, but I suppose at least if we went to future urban, um, you know, the other thing is that we could look at um, alternative uses of that site that don't necessarily um, stick with what they proposed, which was the, uh, uh, what did they call it? Uh, general residential. Um, and then, you know, like, as I mentioned in my last comment, I mean, if you look at, you know, Salamanca Square, that was a, uh, a, was a, resi uh, a quarry, and uh, they've, kept, they've developed that quarry site into a, some really nice apartments that, you know, and, and a public open space in a square that, that, you know, that people of Hobart use you know, quite regularly and I think you know, people really appreciate that, that um, that's the other way of creating the public open space rather than doing it as a natural area, it could be a, a plaza, who knows. But anyway, I suppose at least if they, it gives the opportunity for these guys to come back, have a look at the drawing board, identify some of these issues and, and get a little bit more detail in relation to what they do with the quarry. Um, if it could be turned into something like that, great, but at least it gives them the opportunity to, to look at all of this because I mean, I think as a few people have actually commented, you know, leaving it as Rural residential just doesn't make sense. You know, it's close to services, it's inside the urban growth boundary. Um, there's, there's access from both sides. Um, and if we're all about giving people the opportunity to unlock the value in their land and create opportunities for other types of housing that aren't necessarily four bedrooms, two bathrooms, two garages, you know, we might find some innovative ways of, of coming up with something different in that space. And that's up to them to come back to us with, with something down the track. But, you know, I don't think we should be looking at a location like that and actually. Uh, Leaving as rural residential because, as uh, Alderman quite rightly said, it's next to the highway, 200 metres from a coal store. So it gives them the chance to at least do something with it. And I think that's the minimum that we should be looking at um, at today's meeting. Alderman Mulder? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that um, future urban still um, allows them to maybe go back to specific plans about the general open space. And, and maybe they do have some vision about quarry could be used as open space. It doesn't have to be a, a playground with a fence around it that we don't allow people into. Um, I, I can just think, you know, like um, active recreation, um, you know. Zip lines. Rock climbing. Zip lines. All sorts of things. So, so, but I mean, that, that would all depend upon on what they propose. So, um, personally, when I look at it, I see the Salamanca quarries and I see inner residential. And if you look at the guidelines for inner residential, it talks about access to transport, access to services, um, and although those services aren't quite there yet, there's a shopping centre and route that, you know, plan to be built as Alderman uh, Walker puts it, um, three doors up. So um, it meets a lot of those those requirements. The issues surrounding um, access to South Arm Highway, and I see we've got a representation on that, is actually moot because in conjunction with the, um, with the, with the uh, road, and I think we've had this one back to when I was on council, so I'm um, at the risk of ancient history there, but um, to the last time, uh, but that access is actually not going to be used, and, and, and if Dyer have a sister, or Dyer or State Growth or whatever their name is now, or the Department of Main Roads that has a reluctance to build roads, um, <laughs> the, um, the, the fact is, is that this particular uh, piece of land is now going to be a natural um, extension of a connector street um, through uh, from uh, the drive, um, is it the end drive? Yep. Into uh, Norfolk uh, Terrace or something. So, um, you know, all those issues about road traffic and, and the access to the uh, to the highway are now uh, done and dusted. Uh, and uh, we're now left with what's the best use to make of this? Because the last thing I would like to see is that for the rest of our life we are stuck here with an eyesore off the main highway uh, for a site. And I think that um, the potential of building terrace runs into that into that cliff face it would be really innovative use and it would give the landowners a lot better lot view I think than some general residential and a, and a cliff face so um, it's an opportunity um, but it's not for me to um, to impose my wishes or desires on them 
but um, I think by adopting this motion as against, against the other one, um, we'll just allow a little bit more time for some more little thinking, and, um, and I fully endorse this. There's one thing that, it will, that, that should not happen. We should not stick this and move it with rural residential and move it with all the issues. There is, there's no need for a structure plan. Um, it's within the urban growth boundary, um, and, um, and, and the topography and stuff is just inappropriate for the use of rural living. Now, it's the idea that you can somehow, rural living isn't designed for um, agriculture, it's designed for um, living with a rural asset, with a rural theme to it. So, in other words, you might be able to run a horse or something like that. Well, um, any attempt to use this for a rural style pursuit, um, it's a bit hard to quarry. Does anybody else need to speak to this? Like, yes, look, I, I understand and I support the, the recommendation, but could I just pose a question to Mr Lovell, yeah. uh, Mr Mayor, and that is, Mr Lovell, um, when, uh, let's, let's assume that this, obviously this matter does come towards the TPC, um, would the TPC um, consider the uh, representation from the uh, company that's been um, uh, lodging, Francis Beasley, uh, of ERA Planning, and uh, and would the uh, the uh, TPC make a, a contrary decision to what uh, council may make in this instance, as far as future urban? I know it's a bit of a hypothetical, but I'd just be interested to hear what Mr. Lovell well, Through Mr. Mayor, we give no guarantees on what the Commission will say, but they will certainly receive the submission that has been made on behalf of the applicants, and they'll also get the chance to appear at the panel hearing and to and to take it further. And uh, and um, there's a number of options that will be before the Commission at that point. But uh, I won't predict exactly what the outcome is, but um, but it, it will have every chance. Okay. okay. Any other speakers? There being none, I'll put the motion, which is 11.1, .1, that 450 Rugby Road be uh, rezoned to uh, future. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. I've got the wrong page here. Yeah, future urban. <laughs> uh, all those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Moving on to uh, move to recommendation number 12, penultimate one, 8 and 14 drift through Driftwood Drive uh, rezoning from rural living to low density residential. Um, who do we have to move in this one? Uh, Alderman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And do we have a seconder, please? Alderman, uh, Alderman Mulder. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the um the current zoning that's been proposed by the officers is for um, a continuation of what the zoning is, and that, of course, is that um, it be uh, basically maintained as rural living. And the proposal here before the council is for low density residential. Uh, there has been no natural justice conflicts in the change because every rural living zoned lot within the area has been developed developed for residential purposes. And these particular lots uh, actually abut the, uh, the other uh, smaller lot sizes within the area. The other point I uh, would like to make is that um, it is consistent um, with the state policy because the low density residential zone would provide infill opportunities and development for residential purposes and it's a more effective use of infrastructure and road frontage, in particular for the property or the access at 14 Driftwood Drive. It's interesting that the lots 8 and 14 are all sub-minimal lots, significantly below the two hectare lots prescribed by the application of rural living area B, and proposed, and therefore rural living zone users are in compatible with the character of the area. So you have very, very small lots, um, and in the case of properties 8 Driftwood Drive and 14 Driftwood Drive are approximately 0.96 hectares and 1.2 hectare respectively. So they are all sub-minimal lots, significantly below the 2 hectare, contrary to that being proposed for inclusion in the rural 
living area B. And we also are well aware that um, at one of our recent meetings we um, approved uh, a development uh, at uh, Possum Bay and those um, lot sizes are within that particular zone and but they are of, of a, a nature which are really uh, compatible with what the existing lots at number 8 and number 14 Driftwood Drive are, are at that scale. And I can repeat again that the, the properties at 8 Driftwood Drive and 14 Driftwood Drive are approximately 0.96 you know, one, basically one and 1.2 hectares. So why wouldn't we consider having a, uh, a change to this so that there is a conformity with the adjoining lots? And you have at the moment two of these uh, particular lots which are adjacent to smaller lots which are within the low density and um, within the uh, low density residential area. And then on the other hand, you, if they, they maintain it, it just means that they would remain in the rural, uh, the rural, um, uh, can, rural, um, uh, within the rural uh, living zone. So I see council support to right the wrong to actually allow these to be brought into the envelope that exists abutting these two properties and seek council support. Thank you, Lord and Mark. Uh, yes, um, not to say too much, except um, the one issue there, I think, is um, um, more development, uh, more problems for um, Spit Farm Road, and might I say, um, just and more impetus for us to uh, revisit the Bodega Court access through the uh, through the uh, back to um, to take the pressure off uh, Bodega Road, off um, Drift, Spit Farm Road with a with, with a proper road. So um, rezoning this um, does uh, put some impetus back to us, but that alternative to Spit Farm Road is something we desperately uh, need to be having a look at uh, because it's only a matter of time before some uh, before a, a coroner serves it up to us big time. Other speakers. to me. I mean, I know there's issues, but look, we can pick issues up in any uh, development and a lot of places where roads need to be improved or things need to be done better, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it just does it's not, you know, I can't see how we could have, you know, high-density de high re uh, residential and then rural living in, in a gap in between. It just doesn't make sense. So, uh, you know, once again, people want to live there, so I think we should, uh, um, and, and look, in the longer term, it'll give us the road base to actually deal with some of the issues in relation to the roads down there and actually help us uh, make that something more likely to occur because we've got more people using the road. So I would support um, you know, this, this motion. Thank you. Uh, I'll put the motion as proposed. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, against. The motion is carried. And moving on to the last motion, number 13. Uh, in regard to rezoning land at four and six page court to in a residential Alderman Newington. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Alderman Pierce. Alderman Newington. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I, I, you know, I've mentioned this before at other times in front of uh, you know, fellow Alderman here. I mean, you know, you look at Clarence, we really haven't got much 
Well, actually, no, I'll, I'll start with the beginning in terms of what, what the uh, representatives submitted there. I think that's important. Um, the parcel of land at, um, in Page Court, um, it's got sloping topography, um, side of a hill. It's close to bus stops, close to Eastlands, close to services. Um, and the, the, um, the owners think that it would make uh, a good place to develop for you know, medium high density apartment style development um, because it's close to Eastlands, close to uh, you know, shops, transport and all those sort of things. And I think just on that, you know, I certainly think that's a, that's a valid response from them. You know, you look at the Eastern Shore and we really haven't had any apartment buildings uh, built in, in Clarence. I mean, we've got Alma Street, which would be, oh, I, mean, I can remember that being there when I was in infant school. So, you know, there, there's really no, you know, high density apartments. Um, and the only one I can think of is one that I think we all probably would probably not like to see there, but that one in, um, in more recent times. But, you know, went Clarence Street on Wentworth Park, Little Harrow Boots, you know, that's really the only smaller apartments that we've got, you know, in Clarence. Um, and, and the thing that we need to remember is that there needs to be an entry point into the market, which is not always a four bedroom house with two cars, two bathrooms, and on a you know, six, seven hundred metre square block. And even, you know, even the high density they're talking about here with a, a unit on 325 metres, I mean, some people don't want a backyard at all. Um, and I think it's important for us to create that entry level point for some people to, to, book, to buy a smaller studio that's in an apartment block, that's a single person that doesn't need a lot of space who wants the opportunity to get into the market and see that, that capital gain over a period of time, which is then a stepping stone into something else. And I think not only in this location, but I think seriously as a council, we need to be looking at identifying some places where we think this might happen. Now, I know we've talked about Moraine as being somewhere that we, we might be looking to support those sort of things, and, and there's some other places that, that have come up in discussion. But I think that is a really important you know, thing that we have a responsibility to not just say that it's all going to be the same, and I, I certainly don't think, you know, we need some innovation out there. Um, I mean, there's some negative issues that were raised by the council staff in relation to traffic, but I mean, look, the amount of traffic that goes up a bit along the road every day is, is you know, is a lot. Um, you know, there's, there's turn-offs on Cambridge Road all the way along, so I mean, go, the amount of traffic going in there, I don't think is going to make a huge difference. Um, dealing with wheelie bins and all that sort of stuff. I mean, ultimately it comes down to, the, to whoever develops this, if it's the owners of the land or they um, go to someone else. The market will take care of those sort of things to make sure that there is adequate parking, that there is a reasonable place to store your bin nearby. Um, because if they don't, well, people won't buy them. So, you know, I think it's not up to us to overanalyse all these things and come up with all the solutions because that's what the responsible people have to come up with ways of, of making money out of these things, um, and they will do that. Um, you know, it's inside the obviously it's inside the urban growth boundary because it's. it's uh, or consistent uh, rezoning the properties. Here's one of the council, uh, one of the staff have said that it's consistent with the um, um, STR or LUS. I'll do it that way rather than try and come up with my own version of it. Um, and I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's still an opportunity, regardless of what, whether, you know, if we get the support to do this now, there's still a bit of water under the bridge to deal with all these issues and the, and the natural justice issues of the other landowners around to get their opportunity to have their two bobs worth. So. I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's a piece of land that, that is not going to work as a couple of residential blocks, and I think it's an opportunity for us to you know, give these guys a chance to uh, come up with some innovative ways to create different types of housing in our city, which I think is really important. So I encourage everyone to support this one. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, what are all these So 
questions to doctors, pharmacists. Um, and I know the local area I found when I was working in Kingborough, I would be occasionally uh, treating patients that had, had to move because of a partner had broken hip and, and the house was suddenly not working and all of a sudden they had to move and the only option for them was somewhere 20 k's away, away from all that social infrastructure. So tonight the biggest loser, loser through this process has been around um, the use of this zone and that's, that's more homework for this council. Finding a way that we can uh, use it in, in existing sort of communities so that people have that option to, to age in place without overwhelming the, the, the style and nature of things is, is a challenge for us moving forward and something we've got to step up to the mark on. Um, there's a lot of friction in our community and around some of the development that occurs just in general residential because of the nature of these blocks where um, it's a very easy algorithm to do two garage, four bedroom, townhouse in what was once a backyard. And that is creating friction. A part of that is occurring because the way that the zoning is, is setting up, the options for the, you know, if you like to know, the, the, the smaller scale downsizing or whatever, it just isn't there. So uh, hopefully it will be the start of this process, um, but it is something that, that we should be moving forward on. So uh, very happy to support it. Thank you. Other speakers? Alderman Muller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of points is that the rezoning of Page Court will reign. The request was to modify it to general residential. The office was quite correct to point out it already is residential. But um, the text of the representation indicated that they were talking about a higher density general residential, which actually means inner residential. So, um, you know, in fact, the officer's um, comment on the, uh, on the thing with the property will already zone residential. Alternatives are rezone inner residential or introduce an SSQ related to increased density, uh, if so much how they've identified the issues as page called intersection and public interest, which of course um, both those issues, uh, you know, the page called intersection, um, that's one thing for Cambridge Road. Oh, if only we uh, were to uh, get on with the Lord of our ramps and we might actually reduce some of the traffic on Cambridge Road, but um, I don't think they are showstoppers and certainly it is. Can I say that um, the inner residential zone is designed for uh, places that are um, characteristic, characterised by higher density uh, with a greater presence of non-housing activity. Um, proximity activity centres with a range of services and facilities. Well, here we are, Lorraine, lots of uh, activities and services, very close walking distance to um, the Rosney Park CBD. Um, the other point is it's located along high frequency public transport corridors. Well, uh, I reckon there'd be a bus running down um, Cambridge Road every 10 minutes. Um, so it, it ticks all the boxes in terms of the zoning guidelines. It also um, is what the, um, the officers um, indicate is a, is a possibility with it. Um, and, um, and, and therefore it goes. Having said that, um, I wouldn't like to be under a pandemic house arrest in an apartment, and I would hate for the kids to be there. <laughs> you would go stir crazy, um, and um, you know, and, and uh, where we, where I would have probably been in my middle space if I hadn't been able to get out in the backyard and potter around with a few building works and doing something. I don't know, but that's me, um, and uh, and uh, I'm not going to buy one of these apartments. But that doesn't mean people who want to should be able to. So I would want to wholeheartedly support it. Any other speakers? In that case, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Uh, the motion is carried. So where we're at now is that uh, the table, the motion before the chair is the officer's recommendation as modified by one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, missing out on seven, eight. Nine is in, 10 is out. 11 is out, but 11.1 .1 is in, and 12 and 13 are in. So uh, that's the motion that's on the table. It's been moved uh, by Alderman Walker, who has a right of reply after the debate. The seconder oh, yeah. has reserved their right of reply. Uh, so um, the floor is open for a regular debate on the consolidated motion. Alderman Walker. First of all, can I acknowledge the, um, the incredible uh, amount of work that the, uh, the planning staff have gone on, gone into on this particular one, and um, and, and having done a, a bit of work of reviewing only some of their work, I can thoroughly understand why it took the three months it did to get to this thing. So to be utterly commend the hard work in fact they did, and I hope they don't take any offence at the fact that uh, maybe.
who I haven't always agreed with them, as, um, as, as, as we will get used to in politics, that um, some days um, you've got your advice. I, I'd be willing to entertain a further amendment that includes it. Congratulations and thanks to the staff. Well, I would, I would move that amendment if it's oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. I might also like to say I probably deserve a bit of a pat on the back myself because I put some yards into it too. I, well, I was actually going to include that, but not the motion. Or the motion. <laughs> Well, we wouldn't want the public record underlining that, would we now? And thank you for your interjection. I welcome some. <laughs> but um, no, I think that the, it's been a great exercise, and I will reiterate here that um, we are only providing advice. We aren't the decision makers. And our advice, and, and that's the point at which we represent the community, and where they have put together valid planning reasons and, and, and issues. Um, one of the issues that I'd like, that I'd sort of highlight um, in the process is that when we're acting as a planning authority, we are acting almost like the regulators. We, we aren't in a position there. This is the law, these are the things, this is what we have to follow. When we get to this strategic stuff, that's the time that we have to be starting to think outside the square, within the broad policy parameters, but we're not, I don't think it's appropriate that we as elected representatives, when we're talking about the actual structure of the scheme. I, for one, am sick to death of um, having people come to me and complain about a decision that we have been made, and some of them aren't too nice about it, right, when in the fact, when in the end, we didn't have any alternative. That was what it was, that's what it complied with, and um, as Cremorne Avenue picks his head up. But here is an opportunity for us to have an impact on that planning scheme and on those things. And the objectives under the looper are that there will be engagement with the community and that there will be engagement with local government. And this is the best time when we're setting up these schemes for us to go and put our views forward. If they're not acceptable to the planning commission and they do something different or they go along with another particular line, then it's on their heads and it's on their accountability because I, for one, am sick to death of being blamed for decisions that other people have made. So um, all I can say is that I think the debate has been very good, mostly. Um, I think it's been uh, a little bit heated and passionate, perhaps too much at times, uh, but that's the nature sometimes, I think, of, of debate. But it's been sensibly conducted, and I must com I, I compliment um, all the speakers that have been there tonight on um, having done their homework, having looked at the issues and, uh, and uh, been generally relevant to the issues at hand. Um, and uh, so uh, whatever the TPC makes of this, I'm satisfied that everyone around this chamber and the planning staff have all gone above and beyond to produce what we see today. So um, thank you very much and I, uh, I will be in, in, uh, endorsing the, uh, uh, the amended opposite of the Other speakers? Can I just ask a question of either the general manager or Mr. Lovell? Is that possible? Sure, it's part of your time though. But, uh, yep, I, I'm, that's all I want to actually ask. Sure. Yep, I don't want to say anything further. Um, am I correct in my understanding that there will be considerable expense in hiring independent experts to support successful alderman recommendations? which are contrary to the officer's recommendations, as the officers would actually be conflicted if they were to take on the task? Uh, General Manager. Um, thank you for the question. I might actually ask Mr Lovell to, or Mr Ford to answer that. They may be able to provide some more uh, detail than I can. Very Mr Mayor, um, the procedure will be um, for those um, decisions which weren't in accordance with the officer recommendation, we owe it to ensure that they're given a red hot go at the, tri at the commission. So um, we would need to engage external parties to do it. So there's no potential conflict of interest or no um, exposure or council staff to the commission who might ask questions which don't help the council. So we will be engaging appropriate experts. Um, we'll need to review now uh, what experts we need for those matters. Um, we will most likely use uh, council's lawyer uh, and we will uh, most likely engage a planning consultant uh, and, we'll, and we'll take advice from the lawyer as to whether we need an engineer, for example, or some other party. So we'll work through that now, but there will be certain expenses involved um, in order to ensure that 
that every council decision is given as they are ready to go. Thanks, Mr. Uh, I'll just quickly, um, you know, being someone that isn't always complimentary towards bureaucrats, I, I have to turn around and acknowledge the effort that Dan and Ross put in. I mean, as you put your pay in a very important role, I know this has been a hell of a lot of work. Whether it's too late for you to have a beer at the end of the night, um, if not, I, I hope you sit back and relax and enjoy uh, a bit of peace for a couple of days at least anyway. Um, we know obviously disappointed with a couple of the outcomes tonight, but I mean, that's democracy. You know, we sat down, we argued our case. Um, we're not always going to agree, and that, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think overall, you know, it's you know, been a learning experience for me to go through this process. And, you know, I think we've got some really good outcomes tonight, and I, um, and I you know, acknowledge the efforts that everyone's put in tonight. I also want to say thank you, Tony. You did put in a lot of, a lot of work with this, and I think, um, you know, I think, you know, it's... Uh, not, the, not necessarily every outcome, right, but I, I think, you know, overall, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Other speakers? In that case, uh, Alderman Edmonds, yes. Well, Alderman Edmonds first, then. Uh, yeah. Oh, OK. Alderman John Wishes. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank the Council for the work that they've done. I will be very briefly. I'm not going to rehash anything we've talked about tonight. I just wanted to to say I'm very happy that the motion's been amended to, to recognise the contributions of staff because I cannot imagine how many hours have gone into all of this work and the probably very good sleep nights because it certainly at times have been very good for helping sleep. Um, I think we should also recognise the 107 representations that were put in. That's, that's a lot of work on behalf of the, the ratepayers and, and property owners in our city and I think they have also put in a lot of work in this. And, and I guess for me, it comes down a little bit to like voting on the budget. I don't agree with everything that we've passed tonight. I voted against some of them, but overall, I think we've got to a good place. And I think from that point of view, we need to support the recommendation with the modifications that have been approved. Thank you. Um, right reply, Yes, thank you. Shall I use the full five? <laughs> uh, you, you only get three on a right of reply. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the only certainty is that the recommend uh, the modifications recommended, the only certainty with that is none of us agree that they were the right ones that should have gone forward. That is a unifying factor. Irrespective of that, um, this mechanism, as laborious as it might have been, allowed every, every old woman who all of us put a lot of time and agonise over certain ones, a, a chance to express uh, those concerns or, or that, 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 those enthusiasms and sometimes um, you know, that was successful and other times it wasn't. So um, it's been truncated but this was certainly the, I think, the right way to go forward. So as I now vote, and it's my intention to vote in favour, uh, I'm doing so and you know, disagreeing with, with, um, with, with a lot of what's going forward, or a decent chunk of it, but uh, really respecting the democratic process in which it happened. And again, it's already been made, but I, uh, I appreciate it all times, not just the depth of advice that staff have offered, but their candour. Their candour to just tell that they believe it was. So, thanks again. Thank you. So the motion is the officer's recommendation as amended through the process, including an appreciation of the staff and this board in particular. Would you like that as a part of the recommendation? That, that, that or that or note, note at the end after the uh, it's got to be in the motion. So, on, uh, well, does that complicate it going to the commission? I, I think it probably does. No. Uh, okay, well, we'll take it as a note in a minute. To yeah. 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 motion to move another motion. Yeah, okay, yeah. we'll take part B. We'll take it as part B. A second motion. Mm. Separate from the LPS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number five. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. we'll, ta we'll take it as a part B, and we've got it yeah. as a part B. So, all those in favour? Against? Of what? Of the oh, consolidated motion. Yeah. The amended motion of the planning matters. Come on, Shane, put your No, no. I'll, look, I'll put the vote again. So, the motion before the chair that we're voting on <coughs> is the officer's recommendation as amended. That's part A. Part B is our appreciation of the staff. Oh, I want to appreciate the staff. All right, well, we'll take a second vote. motion on that. Moved? Was that seconded? Yes. Thank you. So we're voting I'm on the motion. Well, I'd like to speak on that by saying that that question now be put. <laughs> <laughs> so this vote is on the 
Father, which is the motion as amended. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Part B, our appreciation of the staff, Mr Ford in particular, all those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. <laughs> and can I add, uh, in general, with the theme that's been around, uh, look, thank you all very much for the way you've approached this. It's been a mega effort. It certainly uh, required us to have a special council meeting, uh, given the time that it's taken, but it has enabled us to work through the whole process very diligently, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in that. Thank you. And congratulations, Tony, for the work that you did in your